Section 1 of The Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton. The Georgics by Virgil, translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book 1, Part 1. I will try, my Cenus, a song of rustic things, of the growing of gladsome crops, and the favouring star for turning the sod and binding the wanderings of the vine to the elm, and the care that oxen are, and the zeal of him who maketh his flock increase, and the law of him who nurtures the thrifty bees. O ye most luminous powers, whom still the year followeth in its march along the sky, O lights of the world, Bacchus and Ceres dear, through whom earth bringeth forth abundantly. Oaks of Caonia yield to the corn and vine, and draughts of the Achilles are mixed with wine. And ye, field-haunting fawns, whose gifts I sing, dance hither, fawns, dance hither, each dryad maid, and help me. Help me also, thou, O King Neptune, whom once the smitten earth obeyed, and gaping under the trident's mighty blow, sent forth a furious horse from the depths below. Dresser of groves, I will even call on thee, whose herds by the hundred, with hides all snowy white, browse the lush brakes of Seos, and favour me, thou shepherd Pan, by Menelus thy delight, from lawns Lycian, I from thy leafy home, O Tegian, arise, arise, and come. May Lady Minerva of the Olive lend her aid, and the young lord of all the hooked plough, and old Silenus, with uptorn cypress tender, and rural divinities all, attend me now, who bring to the growing fruits unsown and new, and shed on the sowing the largesse of heaven's dew. Thou too, O Caesar, of whom we know not yet, where in the halls divine thy place shall be, whether a city's guardian thou be set, or one of the gods who shelter husbandry, and thee the mighty circle of earth salute, as monarch of storms and giver of all good fruit, or yet as deity of the unmeasured main thou comest, binding thine own brows the while with the beech myrtle of thy mother, vain to other shrines the seaman to beguile, for Thule serves thee, and one of Tethys' daughters brings thee as bride a dowry of all waters, or else mayhap in the lagging months and burning thou springest as a new star to heaven's height, just where the virgin from the scorpion turning makes entry for thee. The fierce claws disunite before thee, and the grasping monster yields his unjust holding in the celestial fields. Whate'er thy lot, for Tartarus may aspire to no such ruler, nor thou to that sad throne, though Greece the Elysian glory so admire, nor hearkeneth Proserpine her mother's moan. Make smooth my sailing, favour my bold essay, Pity the hind with me, assume thy way, begin to hearken to mortals when they pray. With the running of cold hill streams in the early spring, and the crumbling of clods at the touch of the western air, bid thou thy bullocks begin their labouring at the plough, and hail the flash of the cleansed share, whose land hath twice felt sun and frost, shall house barn-bursting harvests in answer to his vows, but, ere we cleave with the iron that unknown sea, learn we of the winds and the weather's changeful face, and what the ancestral haunts and habits be of things that grow, the loved of every place and the rejected. For here springeth corn, and there, anon, the exuberant grape is born, and everywhere the unbidden green we find of grass and tender saplings. Tomolus groweth sweet saffron, knowest thou not? And ivory ind. The soft Sabaean his own frankincense knoweth. Nude Pontian men bring iron and the beaver strong. Epirus palms for the Ilian mares of song. For still upon chosen spots hath nature lain rigorous bonds and the yoke of a changeless law. Since ever Deocalion flung his stones amain over the empty early world and saw straightway the obdurate human race arise, give then to the austere earth thy energies. Bid thy stout oxen, while the year is new, turn the fat soil and let it open lie, till dusty summer have baked it through and through with his ripe suns. 
thou shalt use differently thy churlish land, nor toss it to the light, or ere Arcturus rule the September night, so shall not weeds thy abundant harvest harm, nor some slight moisture fail the sterile spot, but on the alternate seasons hold thine arm, and the field newly gathered assail thou not. Suffer it rather, for so long to lie, fallow and thirsty, under the parching sky, else, in due time, the yellow grain renew, where erst the pulse with its gaily quivering pods, or the rustling leafage of the bitter lupin grew, or tiny vetch upborne upon fragile rods, for oats and flax, they tell us, exhaust the ground, and poppies in their lethean slumber drowned. Thus turning about makes easy all thy toil, drench then with dung the desert, nor stay thy hand, but fling abroad o'er all the outwearied soil the grimy ash, and lo, the relieved land bears newly, even as that thou hast not dressed thanks thee from out the fullness of its rest. Oft, too, it boots to burn an unfruitful field, till the light stubble with the crackling flame be spent, whereby may happen the turf is made to yield the hidden wealth of its utmost nutriment. All noxious damp is bidden to transpire, all vice expelled by the purging of the fire. For whilst the burning opens the myriad ways, mysterious pause, whereby the young plant is fed, and whiles endures the veins their gaping stays, so the fine rains it never more shall dread, nor ardour of sudden sunshine work it ill, nor surly Boreas with his piercing chill. He too shall gladden the land who breaketh up the slumbering glebe with rakes and harrows of osier, and ruddy Ceres from the Olympian top cheer him who smites the furrow's long exposure, crosswise again with plough reversed and wields with keen intent the sceptre of the fields. But pray to the gods, ye tillers of the ground, for weeping summers and winters fair and dry. The dust of winter maketh the grain abound, and Mysia does exult, and throned on high, Gargarus is dazed by his own fruitfulness. And shall I praise his love and labour less, who ceaseth never? But hard upon the sowing hath all his furrows level lain, how so they sterile be. For the streamlets in their flowing, he to his garden plot beguiles, and lo, from the grooved summit of the hill the wave descends, the feverish dying blades to save. And over the polished pebbles murmuring deep it comes to heal with spray the scorched plain. Him also will I ever in honour keep, who lest the stalk sink under the weight of grain, feeds down the luxuriant plants, when first they lift their tender faces above the furrow's rift, and likewise him, by bibulous channels draining the stagnant waters of the unwholesome fen, when, in the season of doubtful sun and raining, a full flood goeth out, until the plain be strewn all over with slime, and the young seeds rot in poisoned hollows, reeking with vapours hot. Even so heavy the cares of tillage be to man and beast, however versed in toil, and still behoves to hover incessantly about the crop, lest wanton geese despoil, or cranes of strymon, or unillumined shade, or bitter succory the field invade. The father of humankind himself ordains the husbandman should tread no path of flowers, but waken the sleeping land by sleepless pains. So pricketh he these indolent hearts of ours, lest his realms be in hopeless torpor held. For ere Jove's day no hind the land compelled, nor might he establish a landmark, nor divide his holdings from his fellows. But all, as one, wrought without question, and the earth satisfied richly their needs. Now those old days are done, Jove to the serpent his black poison gave, bade the wolf prey, and lifted the angry wave and he smote from the trees their honey-dew, and hid the fire in the rock, and the running rivers of wine shut in straight channels. And all these things he did, that man himself, by pondering, might divine all mysteries, and in due time conceive the varying arts whereby we have leave to live, seeking his food by the plough, his fire inviting out of the rocky fastness. Also then it was the conscious rivers began delighting in older craft they had grown, and sailor men numbered the stars and called them all by name, the Pleiads, the Hyads, 
the lights of the bear aflame, and the ways were found to snare and lime the steps of the wood's wild things, and to gird the glades with hounds, and to fling the casting net in the river deeps, and to drag the drenched lines from the sea's profounds, and to set in the wood the saw with steely edge, where men of yore had cloven it with the wedge. Other arts followed, for lo, unflinching toil, backed by stern need, the world hath overcome. Ceres appointed the tillage of the soil, when failed the acorns out of their leafy home. The holy Arbutus vanished, and no more Dodona nourished the faithful as before. Yet even upon the grain fell plagues ere long, mildew defiled the stalks, and everywhere the barbed thistles gathered in lawless throng, till villainous weeds displaced the harvest there. Caltrops and cleavers, darnel, wild oats forlorn, darkened the gracious glistening of the corn. Wield therefore a tireless rake against the foe. Scare birds with din, pay vows to heaven for rain. Shred thy plant's leafage, lest too dense it grow and dark. And thou consider with longings vain thy neighbour's mighty gathering, and assuage, as in the forests of the primeval age, under a shaken oak thy hunger's rage. End of section one. Section number two of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book number one, part two. Be now the weapons in order due rehearsed, which, if he lack, the sturdiest husbandsman sows not nor gathers, the massy plough the first, the Elusian mother's labouring van, rollers and sledges meet for the threshing floor, and the mattock's cruel weight, and, furthermore, all the light wicker stuff by Celsius wrought, hurdles of our butte, and, for the winnowing, Iacus's mystic fan, with long forethought, these various tools do thou together bring, if that thou wouldst the country's life divine, worthily live and call its honours thine. But earlier yet, even in the forest thou, shalt choose a growing elm, and mightily bend, till thou hast shaped a plough-beam for thy plough, the eight-foot pole then fastened on to its end, the mould-boards twain set firm upon either side, where the stout beam the share-head doth divide, and sure the linden light thou hast long since felled, for the yoke and the lofty beech in its turn laid low, for the handle so that from behind impelled, thy rusty chariot may freely come and go. For hung in the searching smoke this beechen wood, winnoweth a vigour hardly to be withstood. Full many a precept given by them of yore might I deliver, would men but hear nor scorn, so trivial cares and first of a threshing floor. Smooth shall it be by heavy rollers worn, and skilfully wrought and packed with cretan clay, that never a grass blade through its chinks find way. For the pests that mock thee are manifold, small mice build house and granary safely underground. Owls have their nooks, blind moles a couch devise, and earth's most villainous creatures most abound. The weevil swarms in the stacks, and the busy ant toiling and moiling against a winter of want. Again, the forest search for the walnut tree, in the time of bursting leaves and odorous bloom, if many flowers have set, thou shalt verily see a marvellous threshing after the fierce heats come. But if the shadow of leaves alone be thrown, the fruit of thy threshing floor shall be chaff alone. There be who plant not till they have steeped their seeds in olives' bitter juices, or in lye. For so the yield of the dubious pulse exceeds, and cooks by a lesser fire. Yet seen have I the fruit of long and diligent labour lost, that which thou gatherest year by year bears most, but evermore under a fixed decree, waste all things and decline and backwards glide, even as far-spent oarsmen thou mayst see, holding his boat against an unfriendly tide, till the tense arm relax and the current strong hurrieth the unresisting bark along. Be it ours to study with intent as keen, Arcturus and the glittering dragon, and the twin kids darkling weather, as air hath been, Theirs who through wild seas come to their own land. Faith gales of Pontus, or attempt the strait, 
of papal people Abydos infatuate, when Libra sways the firmament and hath made equal our slumbering and our waking hours, parting the world midway between light and shade, ye men of the soil expend your oxen's powers, putting in barley till hard upon the time when stubborn winter bringeth its rain and rhyme, and so of the flax and the poppy of Ceres' love, drive the plough briskly, cover the grains with mould, while the land is dry, while the rains yet linger above. Thee too, Lucerne, the furrow that shall unfold, must fallow be and crumbling to dust away, while beans are sown ere the ending of the May. Thy millet be newly planted year by year. At the season when the white bull of the gilded horn leads off the signs and Sirius does appear, being by a hostile star of glory shorn, but if thou ask of the land its richer grains, and the bearded wheat alone reward thy pains, the daughter of Atlas ere the dawn shall hide, and the nosian star of the burning crown decline, or ever the furrow's claim be satisfied, the seed to embrace all undue haste of thine, trust the year's hope to a soil unready yet. Many there be who will plant ere may are set, but the so desired harvest mocks their want with hollow ears, yet haply, if thou dost deign, the vetch or the humble kidney bean to plant, or the lentil of Pelysium signal plain, setting booties doth in heaven's display, so then until hoary winter's midmost day. Lo, hear the cause wherefore the resplendent sun, dividing the dominion of the sky, through twelve great signs his high career doth run. The zones of heaven are five, Incessantly one gloweth ruddy under the torrid flame of the flashing orb, on either side the same. Far to the uttermost left and right extend realms darksome with cerulean ice and rain. Yet the gods, willing poor mortals to befriend, award them generously midway these twain. Other twin regions which the sidelong march of the mighty zodiac doth overarch, and this our world at Scythia ward doth rise, as though the dizzy Rhyopian peaks to climb, forth away to the south where Afric lies. High over the north ascends one pole sublime, but the mains tread underfoot the neither pole, and the inky Stygian waters over it roll, and there the mighty dragon of many coils, winding about like a river of fire doth seem, to take the twin bears in his terrible toils, the bears who shrink with fear from the ocean stream, but here, they say, there is darkness infinite. No change, no sound, but a rayless, timeless night. Or else may happen, when fair Aurora saith here her farewell, withdrawing the daylight thus, she seeks those realms. But when the earliest breath of the Orient's quivering steeds moves over us once more, then Vespa, star of the rosy face, beameth her last on that mysterious place. So it is that we seek our weather lore. In a fitful sky see time and harvest learn, And when on treacherous deeps to ply the oar, When launch the full-rigged craft when timely return, Forestward for the felling of the pine, Not vainly then the year's fourfold design, We ponder nor the stars rising, nor its decline. But if cold rain impels the churl forsooth, Then is the time each indoor task to speed, Against brightening weather, then the plough's blunted tooth is sharpened, and for the vineyard's day of need, hollowed our trees for troughs, and branded plain are the cattle, and numbered all the sacks of grain. There are forked props to be cut, the vines to bear, and a marion willow ties for the tender sprays, and bramble twigs to be wrought into wickerware, and corn to be roasted and ground on these dull days, for the laws of the gods and men alike allow, even upon holy days these tasks I trow. Due reverence ne'er forbade thee drain thy field. Fence crops ne'er birds, nor kindle the briar, tis clear, nor the bleating flock to the healthful streams to yield. With apples and oil no less the muleteer may saddle his plodding beast and bid depart, black pitch to bring and millstones from the mart. With varying influence over tasks like these hath Luna each her following days endued. Shun I the fifth, for then the Eumenides were born, and pallid Orcus and Earth's fell brood, Chiresis, Iapetus, and Tyophanus, dire brethren who dared against high heaven conspire, for thrice huge Ossa did they essay to lift, on Pelion and leafy Olympus on the twain, but thrice the father, launching his lightning swift, levelled the pile. On the seventeenth morn again thy vines are set, thy bollocks shall broken be, and the leashes put to thy warp, 
but the ninth shall see thy runaway thief overtain and thy slave go free there may be many labours meet for the cool night season or the dewy hours while yet the morn is new then is light subtle reaped and with equal reason sere meadow lands for never doth healing dew quite fail the darkness and one man well i know who tarrieth late by his winter's fireside glow feathering the wooden torch with dexterous knife while singing singing to lighten her long toil plieth her comb at the web the busy wife o set as her sweet must over the flame to boil skimming the liquor with the vines gathered leaves what time the very brazen vessel heaves but in high summer is reaped the yellow wheat and in high summer is threshed the ripened corn if therefore he plough or sow it is still meet the labourers strive unclad and lo his turn for resting and feasting comes in winter weather when the crops are housed and the hinds make merry together o oh dear the season that bringeth surcease of care as the port to the mariner when his craft oppressed cometh safe home and the seamen jovial are and all the prow is with blooming garlands dressed but still must the oak be shorn and the olive grey and the berries of sanguine myrtle stored and bay likewise is now the season of the year snares for the crane and nets for the stag to fling to hunt the tremulous hare and smite the deer with hempen coils of the balearic sling warily cast while the snow fall heavy lies and the river channel toileth in gathering ice End of section number two. Section three of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shreya Sethi. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book One, Part Three. But how of the autumn stars and storms to sing, of all the sleepless vigilance owed of men, when the great heats pass and the days are shortening, or how of the deluge-laden springtide when, upon tender stalks, milk full and ears that way, light in the acre falleth a swift dismay. Ye, I have seen when harvest days are early, and the first reapers the golden fields among, shredding from slender stems the ripened barley, shock as of all the winds together flung in battle, then the very stalks uptorn by the furious hurricane aloft are borne, and whirled into the blackness of the storm the calms and the winged stubble or yet again far over the deep the clouds their squadrons form and the mighty mass rolls inland foul with rain and like a foe the flood bursts out of the sky and the very ether topples from on high lost now the happy labour of man and beast nor seed nor furrow resists the whelming wave the dikes are full and the running streams increased till they roar again and panteth each ocean cave and inlet and by night the vivid lance of the lightning in the father's hand doth glance Earth shakes as the bolt descends, wild creatures flee, and slavish fear strikes into the heart of man. But he, with his flaming sword, smites Rhodope, or Athos, or the Acrosaraonian. Peaks while the rushing rainfall thicks the sky, and the wood sighs loud in the gale and the sea sandals cry meet is it therefore thou consider with awe the lights and laws of the firmament so discern the depths where shivering saturn doth withdraw the orbit where the fires of mercury burn but venerate first the gods and most of all great ceres on her annual festival 
in the clear season when the herbs are springing and winter passeth away and is no more be ready betimes thy pious offering bringing for the lambs are fat and mellow the wines in store and slumbers upon the densely wooded hill are sweet then let the rustic youth fulfill the amber valia milk and honey and wine be poured and thrice the blessed victim round the ripening field while jovial dancers join his train and summon with clamor of sweet sound series into their homes i let men stay the sickle while oak chaplated they pray and lift to the mother many an untaught lay but the father he hath appointed manifold and faithful signs of torrents alike and dearth so that we know what winds compel the cold and the moon's monthly message unto the earth and the tokens of sinking gales and the warnings all which bid the husbandman shelter his flock in stall for when great winds are gathering forevermore the breast of ocean heaveth distressfully cry shrieks are heard in the mountains and from the shore the inarticulate waves make hoarse reply and mightily swells the murmur of the trees oh barely then the keel shall escape the seas when the fast gull cometh in from the outer deep making the shore with a warning note and harsh when high and dry on the sand the cormorant sleep and the heron spurns his haunt in the lonely marsh and overtops the very clouds in his flight also when wind is coming behold at night how many the meteors and how they glide swiftly adown the declivity of the dark and the trains of fightening fire they leave how wide how long nor wilt thou frail by times to mark how chaff and the dropping leaf are whirled amain and flocks of thistle down skim the watery plain then shines the lightning out of the angry north and the houses of eurus and zephyrus shake to the roar of the thunder and while the wealth of the field goes forth on the swollen dikes away from the friendly shore the mariner gathers in his rain drenched sails ah oh, never unheralded come in the rainy gales the soaring crane drops into the valley low beware of the rising the bullock snuffs the air with nostrils wide and hurriedly to and fro about the lakes the twittering swallows fare while the garrulous frogs away in the miry fen deliver their old complaining note again also the ant incessantly travelling the same straight way with the eggs of her hidden store the rainbow quenching its thirst and loud on the wing spurning the pastures whereon they feed before a mighty army of crows all tell of storm so do sea birds various in name and form and they the asian meadow that explore in the sweet shallows of the caister diving when shards of spray from their shaken wings they pour are smitten anew by zest of wanton striving head foremost seek the wave and plunge therein in the gay faint their plumage to make clean even the grim raven albeit alone he treads waste and dry places for the storm doth harp and loudly hail as it is foreknown of maids guarding their flags when all without is dark and the lamp burns dim for the fungus gathering thick and the oil that sputters about the floating wick but when the rain is over and gone 
appear to the foreseeing eye signs no less true of empty and calms and of sunshine clear the hosts of the uttermost stars come out to view no fleece trails over the heaven and the rising moon sheddeth her light beyond her brother's boon the halcyons loved of thetis fold their wings on the warm sands the beast of filthy sty his mumbled fodder no more at random flings mists cling to the meadows and from the roof tree high after sun setting we hear the bird of night tell over and over the tale of her vain despite anon behold a loft in the limpid air the sea hawk nisus and silla shall expiate the rape of that fatal trees of purple hair whithersoever she flies he fierce with hate clamoring follows and loseth not his prey whithersoever they take their airy way list also the rooks in their leafy homes on high glad creatures these i singing under their breath with burden of soft sighs i know not why but deem a joy unwanted gendereth such hubbub for that now they see again their nests and their young in the sweet light after rain not theirs the wisdom of our humanity divinely lent nor more mysterious lore they follow the changeful temper of the sky if the wet south clear if the rare deeps dim once more their mood is changed as a wind blown vapors way therefore the fields are vocal hence the play of the happy flocks and the rooks exultant lay but wouldest thou feel no treachery at all in midnight calms no doubt of the hour at hand look narrowly unto the swift processional of following suns and moons and understand when luna rallieth first her scattered sheen if the round be dark her misty horns between there are floods to fall on the fields of earth and sea if her face be bright with the virgin glow beware of the coming gale for verily fair phoebe glows in the wind it hath i been so her risings also thou shalt enumerate and on the fourth which governeth all her fate if over the heaven a radiant crescent float through the long morrow and for days many more even to the month's end are tempests quite forgot and grateful marine is all along the shore pay votive rites to glaucus and panopea and to melisert child of leucothea the witness of the day star next receive rising or setting in the wave the tale sun told at dawning and rehearsed at eve to the climbing constellations shall not fail shows he a hollow morning face withdrawn immaculate vapors lo an ominous dawn and a wind coming out of the south with peril fraught for cattle and crops and trees nor less the dread when the lucid rising rays in the clouds are caught broken and quenched and from the saffron bed of her tithonus aurora cometh pale then rings the roof to the bound of the ruthless hail and ill shall the tender vine bow shelter then the growing grape yet of the westerling sun regard the changeful colors with keener ken forecasting a deluge when his brow is done gales when it glows white flecks of dark on the fire bespeak a strife wherein wind and cloud conspire on no such even will i my on no such even will i my cable lose 
or venture me on the deep. But if, perchance, when soul returning the vanished day renews, if stainless all his glorious countenance, he'd not light clouds, but watch with a tranquil mind the waving of forest leaves in the shrill north wind. And verily, of the great orb thou mayest invite, yet deeper intimations bid him tell the innermost secrets of the dusky night, the humid hush of the brooding storm dispel, and open the storehouses where peaceful skies await fair winds. Who dares his word despise? Hath he not many a time by signs foretold the instant perils of the unconscious state, blind heavings of rebellions manifold? Did he not, pitying Rome for Caesar's fate, shroud his bright head in black till impious men trembled lest primal night were come again? I. But then, too, the earth and the ocean spake, the dogs abhorred and the words of evil tongue, and we befell the fields of the cyclops quake, and billows of molten rock and fireballs flung from Etna's riven furnaces, while afar all Germany heard aghast the din of war and shudderings as of unimagined fear passed over the Alps while in sacred groves long dumb. A terrible cry arose for men to hear, and pallid spectres out of the night did come. Fearfully, cattle spake unto men afraid. The earth was rent, the streams in their course were stayed, and the gods of bronze and ivory in the fanes did weep and sweat for anguish. One red day, royal Eridanus deluged all the plains, tearing the trees from dizzying heights away, swamping the beast in the stall, and evermore threads of ill omen strayed the entrails o'er. And stately cities did echo all the night, to the howling of wolves, oh, never, verily, fell thunderbolts out of air so calm and bright. Such comets blazed along the alarmed sky, till the hour came when on Philippi's plain, Romans with Romans measured spears again. I, twice unstayed of pitiful providence, the Balkan slopes, the Emathian prairies, run crimson with gore of ours. O oh, long, long hence, in those far marches shall the laboring man upturn the rusted javelin with his share, smite with his folk the empty helm, or bear with awe the bones of the mighty to the air. Gods of the soil, my father's gods and mine, and Romulus and Mother Vesta, who defend the Tuscan Tiber and castled Palatine, suffer our young hero succor still to lend to this distracted century. Long ago, blood of our blood atoned with ample flow the broken oaths of Laomedontian Troy. But long, O Caesar, hath heaven grudged us thee for human victories minister annoy to minds celestial. Wherefore, it is, we see, chaos of right and wrong and terrible throes, of strife abroad and infinite crimes and woes. The plough receiveth no more its honour due. The fields are waste, their tillers are all afar. The curved sickle is taken and shaped anew into a pitiless brand. Rumours of war have suddenly in all the earth increased. At once, from Germany and the utmost east, of the Euphrates they arise. Today, even sister towns, the bonds of peace despise, and impious Mars holds universal sway, and the world is like a charioteer 
who flies forth of the stalls into the course with vain intent his violent horses to restrain they have their will the car wrecks not the rain end of book 1 and of section 3 recording by shreya sethi Section 4 of The Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book 2, Part 1. Enough of watching the stars and tilling the field. To thee, O Bacchus, my strain I now address. I will sing, too, of the olive's tardy yield and all the young offspring of the wilderness. Come to me, father of the winepress, here, where the land is overflowing with thy cheer. Come to the autumnal fields where vines are weighed earthward with thy rich honors, and vats of foam and brimming with the vintage newly made. O jubilant father of the winepress, come, and lend thine aid and fling thy buskins by what time in the must our naked feet we die but first of the generation of all trees innumerable the modes of nature here for some possess unbidden of men's decrees their rural haunts and follow at will the clear meanderings of the waters and such be slim osiers flexile broom and the poplar tree and the gray willows that whiten in the wind so too from the springing of a seed self-sown tall chestnuts and the bay oak of its kind leafiest in jove's dominions and that one that dwelleth beside the oracles of greece otherwise yet the plums and the cherry trees assemble closely about the parent stem their lusty suckers the very parnassian bay loves the great mother shade while young like them such and so variable is nature's way thus fruit trees grow and they of the wild green woods and the shades of consecrated solitudes but man hath wonderful modes of increase found of his good wit from the fond parent tree he severs and sets in furrows of the ground the juvenile plants and bedded slips hath he some cloven in transverse wise and some acute the forest denizen, seeing at his foot the layer's lowly arch, hath prescience clear of others fed upon his own life and soil. Some flourish even rootless, for we hear of venturous gardeners who, in faith, despoil the tree of its topmost spray to hide in earth. Nay, there are tales of yet more marvellous birth. There issueth from the dry, sawn olive wood oft times a living rootlet, and we are ware of separate boughs, in harmless wise, endued with alien fruitage. So the engrafted pear hath ripened apples, and the empurpled plum beside the stony cornel found a home. Mark then, ye husbandmen, the curious thought each several plant after its own kind doth ask. Tame the wild fruit by tendance, and suffer not your fields to rest. O oh, ever-glorious task, tabernus vast in olive robes to drape, and set the slopes of Ismarus with the grape. And thou, Mycenaeus, our glory and our pride, our most renowned and worthiest so to be, make thou the voyage I have ventured by my side. Let us loosen sail, let us fly to the open sea. Yet is not mine the daring that would essay to compass the universe in my numbers, nay. Not were my tongues an hundred, and my voice an hundredfold uplifted, a brazen roar. Come, therefore, friend, for the country of our choice lies hard at hand, and soon may we touch the shore. And I summon thee now to list no mythic strain, preludings weary, and wanderings wide and vain. The plants that seek unbidden the shores of light, however strong of limb and of leafage fair, bring not forth of their kind. Yet nature's might doth only sleep in the soil, and if with care they grafted be, and in artful furrows set, 
the mood of their savagery they quite forget, and the lesson given of man right aptly learn. I, even the sterile rootstock, born away and set in the open, increase doth return. But they that under the shadowing limbs delay of the great mother reft of their young shall be, and withered in all their fair fertility. But slow is the life of the seed-sown tree, and late in the long to be shall men sit under its shade, and fruits, forgetting their sap, degenerate, and birds on the grapes of the wilding vine have prayed, and he must labor and spend who would impose laws of the furrow on each green thing that grows, Layers of the vine, truncheons of olive wood, and stalks of the paphian myrtle, shall reward in kindliest wise thy care, while it is good to slip the spreading ash and the hazel hard, and them of the mighty crown of shade, the trees consecrate evermore to Hercules. Nor elsewise doth the aerial palm ascend, nor Jove's Caonian oaks, nor firs that see visions of drowning seamen, but thou shalt lend grafts of rude arbute unto the walnut tree, shalt bid the unfruitful plain sound apples bear, chestnuts the beech, the ash blow white with the pear, and under the elm the sow on acorns fare. Yet know that grafting and budding are not one. The eye first rendeth away its tenuous vest, pushing beneath the bark. And this being done, close thou in a narrow groove therein depressed the germ of the alien plant, and bid it find life in the sap that circles throughout the rind. But fair with never a knot the stem shall be, thou rivest deep with wedges to set therein, slips of a more prolific ancestry, the which ere long shall high in the ether win with lusty shoots, until the old trunk have known marvel of new leaves, and fruitage not its own. Also the manifold kinds of willows note, and them of the lotus and the elm tree brave. Nor be the Idean cypresses forgot, nor all the shapes that unctuous olives have, some oval and some as bitter berries round, and some like acorns. And diverse kinds are found of apples, and all Alcinous's orchard growth. Nor do the Syrian and the Crustumian pear derive their fruit from the same scions, both nor the huge hand-fillers. And our trees upbear grapes of another vintage on their vines than Lesbia plucks from Methymnian vines. The soils are sterile Thasia's vine that breed, while the pearly grapes of Mariotis love a wealthier dwelling. Scythia brews indeed a wine from the ore-ripe fruit, while they who prove the vintage of Lagos, how so light it be, reel in their gait and stammer in slavery. Costliest of all, the crimson liquors still, and Retic, what of thee? Dare never to vie with treasures the Falernian vaults that fill, nor yet shall the wines of Tmolus issue try, nor even the royal growth of Fene's cape, with juice of the hardy Amenean grape, nor any nor all of these for bounteous flow and that fine virtue that outlasteth years with the lesser argite. Nor disdain I so the exuberant clusters that Bomastus bears, nor thee, O Rhodian, joyfully dedicate unto the gods when the revel's hour is late. But what doth it boot of names and kinds to tell surpassing number? He who would know them all might count the grains of the desert sand as well, Aroused of the hurricane or the waves that fall on all the Ionian beaches, when the east hath smitten the ships and wrought his fearfullest. All grounds do verily not all growths invite. Willows for the stream, alders for the tangled fen, the childless ash for the bleak and stony height, while the strand in the myrtle glorieth. And then bethink how Bacchus joys in a sunny hill, and the yew in the bitter breath of the north wind still, I range the uttermost lands of man subdued, from homes of Orient Araby to the haunts where the wild Scythian hath his limbs tattooed, and lo, each realm engendereth its own plants. Black ebony thrives in Indian lands alone, and the spicy frankincense is Saba's own. 
and what shall I say of the balsam's odorous dew, or the tears of the evergreen acacia trees, or how the fame of the Ethiop groves renew, white with soft wool like that most delicate fleece the Syrian men do gather, or explore the wildernesses of earth's remotest shore, where India borders upon the ocean river, and where no arrow, how so fairly sped, hath overflown the topmost leafage ever, though swift to handle the bow that race be bred? Remains the blessed apple of Medea, bitter and ripening late, and yet men say there is none more meat by healing to expel dark venom from his veins who hath sometime quaffed a brewage of herbs, whereof the malignant spell of some hard stepmother maketh a deadly draught. Now this same citron tree is fair and tall, favoring and look the laurel most of all, and but for its fine odor widely borne, a laurel it might be deemed. The leaves of it and clinging flowers are scarce by the tempest shorn, and median men do find its juices fit the face to anoint, the sorry heart assuage, and soften the weary pain of panting age. But neither shall Medea's groves her wealth untold, nor the beautiful river Ganges verily, nor the current of Hermus running thick with gold contest men's praise my Italy with thee, nor Ind nor Bactra venture in any wise to vie, nor sands of Arabia sweet with spice, not thine the soil that bullocks breathing fire once turned for the sowing of the dragon's teeth. Thou hast ripened no such harvest, dense and dire, of the helms and spears of men upon any heath, but the ever-flowing fount in the groaning vine of Massacus and the olive trees are thine, and the flocks are glad in thee, and the fiery horse issueth out of thy pastures to the battle, and the great bulls bathed in thy holy watercourse, Clitumnus, and all the consecrated cattle come forth snow-white, and meet for the gods of Rome and the temples whither they lead the triumphs home. Perpetual spring is here, and summer days in months that are not summers. Herd and tree give increase twice, while the tiger's ravening ways are far, and the lion's cruel progeny. And he who gathereth herbs doth never light for sorrow upon the treacherous aconite. Nor ever a mailed monster sweeps the soil with measureless curves, nor here as otherwhere heapeth a train so huge in ominous coil. Here too are noble cities, many and fair, and the dwellings of men do throng the sheer cliffside, and rivers under the ancient ramparts glide. But how shall I tell of the tribute of the sea brought hither, or the marvel of mighty lakes? Thee, Larius, most of all, and after thee, Benacus, where the insurgent billow makes a noise like ocean's own? Or the ports rehearse the added strength of the Lucrine barriers, the angry chafing of the excluded deep outside the Julian harbor, loud in vain, while yet the Avernian channels feel the sweep and spray of waters from the Tyrrhenian main? Ay, and this land of ours hath metal treasure, hath veins of silver and copper and no measure of gold in her streams. Her sons are terrible. The Marcians and the Sabellians in their prime, hardened Ligurians, Volscian spearmen fell, and the renowned Camilli are of this clime. Decius and Marius also and their sons, and the race of the Scipios, those doughty ones, and thou, consummate Caesar, who hast subdued the ends of Asia, and dost now restrain from Rome effeminate India's dastard brood. Hail Saturn's land, great mother of fruits and men! For thee will I praise the arts of the olden days, unseal the sacred fountain of song, and raise Escrian measures along the Roman ways. End of section four. Recording by Kevin Brown. Section five of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton. 
The Georgics by Virgil, translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book 2, Part 2. Mark now the varying genius of the earth in various parts. Of soils consider the hue and the strength, and whether they bring richly forth. Low, desolate tracts, and hillsides bleak to view, regions of rocks and brambles and thin clay do nevertheless rejoice in olives grey and full of years, the which are prophesied by the oleasters thronging there and I, and the wildwood berries upon every side. But fields there be, where the grass grows lush and high, sweet soils and unctuous, and that laugh with glee for the very wealth of their fertility. Such be the hollow dells discerned oft from mountain summits, and fed by falling streams with riches and refreshment from aloft. Uplifted to the south wind the valley seems, and the ploughman coming with his curved share misliketh its fair ferns. Yet verily there shall passing vigorous vines in after days lavish their clusters, gush with the sacred rills we are wont to pour from golden patterers. What time his pipe the stout Tyrrhenian fills by the altar side, and the chargers bend and groan with the smoking entrails offered thereupon? But carest thou rather for flocks and herds, to feed steers and the offspring of sheep, and goats that prey upon all sown crops? Behold the opulent mead of far Tarentum allureth thee away, or the lost Mantuan plain lamented ever. Haunted of white swans is yon sedgy river and there are limpid fountains and grass in store, and the herds who browse thereon the long day through do spend of that fair pasturage no more than one brief night restoreth by its cool dew. But the true grain lands are black with fruitfulness, answering with fatness to the share's impress, crumbling without the compulsion of the plough. Thou shalt never see from any other plains, drawn of the staggering bullock's home, I trow, so rich a harvest upon the rolling wains. Yet the forest clearings, too, are apt for corn. They, by the axe of the wrathful planter shorn, when he carrieth ruin into shades unstirred for many a year, and in the wood lays low the ancestral dwelling of the woodland bird, who wandereth abroad in heaven, exiled so the while the desert blossoms under the share. Now there be gravelly wastes which hardly bear rosemary and humble cassia for the bees, while scabious tufer and the cretan clay, devoured of the dark water tortoises, do verily lure from other fields away, and flatter with many a tortuous hiding place, and feed with sweetness all the serpent race. But the land of delicate exhalations, Gleams of wandering mist and copious draughts of dew given back of waywardness in running streams. The land whose garment of greenness I is new, where nevertheless no salt corrosion whelms the iron in scales. Ah, that is the home of elms with vines as with a glorious network bound. It fatteneth flocks, it is full of olive trees. Obedient unto the plough that soil is found of him who tilleth it. Wealthier tracts than these the shores beneath Vesuvius hardly show, nor Capua, nor Lona Serai, where men know never the hour of Clanius overflow. And now will I tell of every soil the test. Thou seekest a land that is passing dense or light, since that for the sheaves of Ceres eye is best, and this the lion clusters doth invite. The eye foretells that which is better worth. Yet sink thou still a pit in the solid earth, and when thou hast all the removed soil restored and levelled it with thy feet, if it fall away, it is rare, and ready to bear the vine adored and to nourish the flock. But the mould that will not stay there where its wont was, and doth still exceed the hollow, that is heavy and strong indeed. Its ridges are stiff, its clods are obstinate, and thou seekest oxen of might to cleave the same. But the saline earth man cannot ameliorate. It is bitter of savour also by its fame, and the apple ripened in so untoward a place forgetteth its name and the grape its ancient race. And thus it is proven. From the smoky rafter the hamper woven of osier thou shalt take, or the strainer of the vineyard, and thereafter pour of you villainous earth therein, and slake with sweet spring water, 
filling it full, and lo, big drop by drop shall the liquid ooze and flow the wicker through, and the bitter taste thereof shall twist the sorry assayer's lips awry. But he who the fatness of a soil would prove gathereth a handful up, then flings it by, and that which clingeth unto the hand like pitch, nor crumbles apart, is over moist and rich, and its grass is tall exceedingly. Yet for me I like not this luxuriance of blade outrunning the ear, this rank fertility. Remain lands heavy or light, by weight betrayed, the dark and pale discerned of the eye alone, and the cold and churlish, hardly to be foreknown by the pine, and the baneful fir, and the ivy dun. These cares fulfilled, be timely labour given to furrowing deep some spacious mountainside, till the brisk breeze coming out of the northern heaven have searched the upturned clod, and wholly dried, or ever thou set the vine of joyfulness, for friable soils do beyond measure bless its bearing, and these come of the winds blowing, and the gelid hoar-frost, and the sturdy hind the loosened ridges diligently or throwing. But they to uttermost providence inclined, have heed that the plant's earliest nurseries, wherein they are trained for their upholding trees, do liken the vineyards where their home shall be. Else will the estrangement from their mother earth bewilder the young things, coming suddenly, and some consider the aspects of their birth, and on the rind the quarters of heaven they write thus to restore, in the vine's unwonted sight, the front it bore, to the fiery south wind's rage, the back it turned to the bitterness of the north, so potent are the ways of tender age. But first consider whether is better worth to place thy vines on the level or the steep, and if thou lovest the lowlands rich and deep, set thick thy plants, and verily they shall bear the more exuberantly. But if thou choose hillocks abrupt or the open slopes and fair, give thy rose ample space, nor yet refuse to draw with diligent measurement and true the undeviate lines of each green avenue. Even as the cohorts of a Roman legion are marshalled in the stupendous day of war, when the lines of battle attain, and all the region becometh a sea of arms and burns afar with the quiver of brazen waves, while the dire onset still tarrieth, and the war-god walketh yet his choice unmade, the awaiting hosts between. So uniform all thy vineyard's companies, not that the eye alone may revel therein, with vain delight, but the land not otherwise may nourish them all alike, nor the branches have broad room in the ambient air to climb and wave. What now of the trench's depth? Entrust thy vine secure to a narrow furrow and a small. But the sturdy tree it is bidden to entwine is deeply set, and the oak more deep than all whose airiest bough ascends no higher ever than its roots go down toward Tartarus. Wherefore never is it shaken of gales or frosts or flooding rain, but, standing in its unmoved tranquillity, outlives unnumbered sons and cycles of men uplifting vigorous arms unto the sky, or spreading abroad, the steadfast centre made, and the stay of all its glorious round of shade. Let never thy vineyard face the settling day, nor dream of staying thy vines on hazel props. Withhold the hand would sever the last light spray for bedding, or the twigs of the tall tree-tops, for love of the soil doth make the lowlier strong, nor ever with blunted blade, the soft shoots wrong, nor suffer the olive with its woody wealth inside thy nurseries, lest there fall a spark of fire from the heedless labourers, and, by stealth, feed long on the fatness under the outer bark, till it seize the pith, and into the ether soar, leaping the leafage with a terrible roar, and running along the branches thence to spring victorious above the summits fair and tall. Then all the forest in flames enveloping, it flingeth abroad in heaven a smoky pall, pitch black, impenetrable. And this the rather when the winds are up in the mountains, and they gather in tempest and fall upon the burning trees and swoop the flame, and carry it bodily. Ah, oh, never in desolated tracts like these shall the stem of the severed vine reverged be, the sucker spring, but only the oleaster, baneful and bitter leaved, or live disaster. 
Hold him unwise who counselleth to lay bare the rigid mould while Boreas breathes amain. For winter bindeth in frost bands everywhere the land, and the buried seed may scarce attain to fasten its rootlet in the unyielding clod. But come when the roseate springtime is abroad with snowy stalks, of the trailing serpent hated to plant thy vineyard. Or let this be done in the first light chill of summer days belated in earliest autumn, ere the receding sun touch the dark solstice with his flying steeds. But spring is good for the grove and the wood, the seeds of plants to be the earth all palpitant praise in springtime of the almighty father sky, who, tarrying not from her so glad embrace, cometh in showers of full fertility, and the mightiest things that be commingled so, minister being unto the least that grow. When the bird-haunted boughs with melody ring, and the very herds of the store have seasons set for love's delight, then the warm zephyrs bring delicious languors unto the land, and get fair offspring of the fields, and everywhere light mists arise, and succulent grasses dare trust the new sunshine. The vine branches young fear never the surge and auster, nor the streams forth of the clouds by northerly tempests flung, but lavish their buds and leaflets. Oh, me seems there were days like these that shone when earth was new. Spring was it, beautiful spring, the great sphere through, and suave the tenor of primeval time. The wintry east withheld its pitiless breath, while the cattle drank the light of the earliest prime. And the iron children of men on their bleak heaths sprung up agaze, and the beasts of the field were given their woodland homes, and the stars were set in heaven. And but for this most merciful interval between the frost and the fire, this rest from pain, if the skies to the earth relented never at all, the labour of all these tender lives were vain. Remaineth yet the setting of slips. Behold, thou shalt cover them deep with well-enriched mould, and the scaly shell or the porous pebble hide therewith. For so shall the rains of heaven find way, and the gentle vapours about the root abide, whence the plant hath life and leapeth into the day. But some with stones their slips from the floods do shield, and some with ponderous shards have half concealed while the dog-star burns o'er the parched and gaping field. End of section 5section 6 of the georgics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lucy kempton the georgics by virgil translated by harriet waters preston book 2 part 3 thy planting done be instant ever to loose the soil at the stem, and the pitiless mattocks ply, nor even as yet the patient earth refuse, again and again, with the burrowing share to try, bidding thy labouring bullocks come and go the length and the breadth of every vineyard row, till the time is come when thou dost ready make slim reeds, and the peeled ones that lichen spears, and carefully fit the sturdy ashen stake by furcate, which the wandering vine upbears till it learned to scorn the winds of heaven and saw the elm tree's topmost layers of greenness o'er. Then I, in the early days, when leaves are soft and the tendrils launched with laughter into the air do strike unstayed for the sunny void aloft, the delicate life thou shalt regard and spare the knife's rude edge and the undue foliage rather with curved and careful fingers choose and gather. But when the extending branches do enfold the elms in a strong embrace, and ere the fear of the iron have touched them, do not thou withhold thy blade, but the flowing tresses freely shear. Then is the time to wield an unflinching sway, and curb the career of every flowing spray. Also thou shalt thy roaming flocks with skill restrain by wattled hedges from the vines, while tender these, and all unlearned in ill, for more than the sun of summer when he shines his fiercest, 
or the perils of winter storm shall the bold gambles thy plantations harm of wanton goats and buffaloes of the wood and browsing sheep and greedy bullocks more than the chill of the gathered hoar-frost or the flood of fire on the scorching rocks thou shalt deplore the venomous tooth of grazing things the mark indelibly set upon the wounded bark therefore and to atone no other crime are goats on the vine god's altars laid all way and still have place the sports of olden time at the crossroads and hamlets of attica where the sons of theseus merry with wine compete and the prize is his who keepeth his footing feet on the oiled goatskin laid in the meadow fair also the orsonian exiles out of troy recite their unkempt measures and rend the air with roistering laughter and they do employ masks rudely fashioned of hollow bark and all the jovial chorus of their mad carnival is raised unto thee o bacchus while they suspend thy rustic likeness upon some lofty pine and the beaming countenance thereof doth lend a more prolific progeny to the vine for the circling hills and the deep vales overflow wherever the god his comely face doth show o oh, meet is the reverence unto bacchus paid we will praise him still in the songs of our fatherland we will pour the sacred wine the chargers laid and the victim kid shall unresisting stand led by his horns to the altar where we turn the hazel spits while the dripping entrails burn now the care of the vines remaineth yet a toil interminable for thrice in the year must be i even and four times ploughed the difficult soil and the clods all thrown behoveth diligently with the back of the pronged fork to shatter and move and to lighten the shade of all the leafy grove for the tillers of earth are weary round do tread and the path is ever the same of the whirling year and after the uttermost leaves of the vine are shred and the sylvan crown dishonoured by the drear and chilling breath of the northern blast no less the cares of the coming year the hind do press till he falleth anew on the vines with satin's blade and shapelier fashions nor do thou delay but earlier than all thy fellows ply the spade and carry thy prunings to be burned away and house thy stakes yet stay thy gathering then too in the fall of the year as in its spring the grapes are in peril of a shade too dense or bound mayhap in a tangle of weed and briar and the one and the other asketh a toil immense and how so broad the acres of thy desire the few are better for tillage furthermore thou must gather the reed along the river shore and the rough broom in the wood and cherish the life of native willows wherewith to tie thy boughs so shall thy nurseries have rest from the knife and the last sole dresser sing in the perfect rose yet even yet must the earth be wrought with zeal to the finest of powder for that jove hath still terrors in air for the ripened cluster's wheel it is nowise thus with the culture of olive trees no curved knife nor tyrannous ray cask they when once they have grasped the soil and faced the breeze earth giveth the plants to drink and doth repay with heavy harvests the cleaving share alone thus the rich fruit that ministers peace is grown so also all the trees that are good for fruit once wear of their sturdy limbs their proper powers they make for the stars with many a buoyant shoot all unbeholden to any care of ours yea boughs in the wild wood are with fruitage bent and the aviaries of the desert radiant with blood-red berries even the cytisus hath life in its leaves and the forest's lofty growth serves to illumine the darkling hours for us with torch and firelight and shall man be loath in steadfast purpose of heart all seed to sow but wherefore dwell on the lordlier things that grow behold the humble broom and the willow trees food for the flock and for the shepherd shade provide and garden hedges and pabulum of bees o oh, merrily wave the box groves o'er thy side citorus fair the nerician shades of fir and happy the fields to see where labourer wields never the rake in hard anxiety yea the stern forests of the peaks possessed highest on caucasus they incessantly beaten and broken by the spirited east yield serviceable woods the pine for the main and the cedar and cypress for our homes are ta'en thence one tree giveth the wain its drum-like wheels 
and won the spokes to be wrought in fashion round by the farmer, and won the ships their curved keels, the willows in withies, the elms in leaves abound. Stout spears are fashioned of myrtle and cornel too for the battle, and bended bows of Eturian yew. Also the linden smooth and the supple box, docile to the keen blade and chisel be that lend them forms of beauty. Unto the shocks of the torrent the alder answereth buoyantly sped down the Po, and under the hollow rind of the ilex and in its empty heart we find the hidden homes of bees. Ah, who shall tell if all the bounties of Bacchus may compare with theirs? He hath been the cause of crime as well. The centaurs, mad for slaying his creatures were, Retus and Pholus and Hylius, he who flingeth his huge bowl at the Lapathy. O oh, happy beyond all happiness did they their weal but know, whose husbandman obscure, whose life, deep hidden from strife of arms away, the all-righteous earth and kind doth well secure. What though for them no towering mansion pours at early morning forth of its haughty doors and halls a surge of courtiers untold? Gaping on the rich portals as they pass, fair with mosaic of tortoiseshell, the gold of broidered vestments and the Corinthian brass. They with no Tyrian dyes their white wool soil, nor yet with cinnamon fowl their limpid oil, but they are at peace in life, in guile untaught and dowered with manifold riches. There's the ease of acres simple, and many a shady grot, and slumber of sweetness under sheltering trees, and living lakes, and the cool of Tempe's vale, and the lowing of herds, are theirs continually. Theirs are the haunts of game on the wooded hill, and theirs a hardy youth unto humble ways are tempered, and patient in their toil, and still the old have honour of them, and the gods have praise, Justice, methinks, when driven from earth away, left her last footprint among such as they. My heart's desire, all other desires above, is I the minister and priest to be of the sweet muses, whom I utterly love. So might they graciously open unto me the heavens, and the courses that the stars do run, therein, and all the labours of moon and sun, and the source of the earthquake, and the terrible swell of mounting tides, all barriers that break and on themselves recoil. Me might they tell, wherefore the suns of the wintry season make such haste to their bath in the ocean bed, and why the reluctant nights do wear so slowly by. Yet, if it be not given me to fulfil this my so great desire to manifest some part of nature's marvel, or ere the chill of age my abounding pulses do arrest, yet will I joy the fresh wild vales among, and the streams and the forest love, myself unsung. O oh, would that I might along thy meadows roam, Spertius, or the inspired course behold of Spartan maids on Tigetus. Who will come and lead me into the Hemian valleys cold, where in the deep shade I may sit me down? For he is verily happy who hath known the wonderful wherefore of the things of sense, and hath trodden underfoot implacable fate, and the manifold shapes of fear, and the violence of roaring Acheron the insatiate. Yet blessed is he as well, that homely man, who knoweth the gods of the countryside and Pan, Sylvanus old, and the nymphs their sisterhood. Him not the purple of kings, the faggots of power, lure ever aside from his meek rectitude, nor the brethren false whom their own strifes devour, nor the Dacian hordes that down the Ister come, nor the throes of dying states, nor the things of Rome. Not his the misery of another's need, nor envy of his abundance, but the trees glad unto his gathering their fruits concede, and the willing fields their corn. He never sees what madness is in the forum, nor hath awe of written codes, nor the rigour of iron law. There be who vex incessantly with their oars the pathless billows of ocean, who make haste unto the fray, or hover about the doors of palace chambers, or carry ruthless waste to the homes of men and to their firesides woe. One heapeth his wealth and hideth his gold, that so he may drink from jewelled cups, and take his rest upon purple of tyre. One standeth in mute amaze before the rostra, vehemently possessed with greed of the echoing plaudits they upraise. 
the plebs and the fathers in their places set. These joy in hands with the blood of their brothers wet, and forth of their own dear thresholds many a time driven into exile, they are fain to seek the alien citizenship of some far clime. But the tillers of earth have only need to break year after year the clods with the rounded share, and life is the fruit their diligent labours bear, for the land at large and the babes at home, and the beeves in the stall and the generous bullocks. Evermore the seasons are prodigal of wheaten sheaves, and fruits and younglings, till for the coming store of the laden lands the barns too straight are grown. For winter is near, when olives of Sicyon are bruised in press, and all the lusty swine come gorged from thickets of arbutus and oak. All the autumn is dropping increase, and the vine mellowing its fruit on sunny steeps, while the folk indoors hold fast by the old-time purity, and the little ones sweetly cling unto neck and knee. Plump kids go butting amid the grasses deep, and the udders of kine their milky streams give down. Then the hind doth gather his fellows, and they keep the merry old feast days, and with garlands crown, Linnaean sire, the vessels of thy libation, by turf-built altar-fires with invocation. And games are set for the herdsmen, and they fling at the bowl of the elm the rapid javelin, or bear their sturdy limbs for the rustic ring. O oh, such, methinks, was the life the old Sabine led in the land, and the illustrious two, Romulus and Remus. Thus Etruria grew to greatness, and thus did Rome, beyond a doubt, become the crown of the cities of earth, and fling a girdle of walls her seven hills round about, before the empire of the Dictaean king began, all the impious children of men were fain to feast on the flesh of kindly oxen slain. I such the life that in the cycle of gold Saturn lived upon earth, or ever yet men's ears had hearkened the blare of trumpets bold, or the sparkle of blades on cruel anvils beat. But the hour is late, and the spaces vast appear. We have rounded in our race, and the time is here to ease our weary steeds of their steaming gear. End of book two. End of section six. Recording by Lucy Kempton. Section seven of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Walters Preston. Book number three, part number one. Book three. Unto thee, mighty Pales, and unto thee, immortal shepherd of the Amphorus, now my hymn I raise, and hearken ye streams to me, and forests upon Lycantius' mountain brow, for the themes that held enthralled in song's delight, the idle spirits of men are long gone trite. There's any yet who hath not heard the tale of hard Eurystices, or of the rites accursed offered Bereris or Alcides' wail for his lost Hylas, any as yet unversed in the lore of Leto and her Delian shrine, or the story of Hippodamia and the shine of the ivory shoulder of Pelops, horseman keen. But the path I strive to follow climbeth steeps, winning whereunto I shall be crowned of men, and the praise of my doings hover about their lips. If life but last, and first unto my own land, will I lead in triumph home the muses' band. I, unto thee, my mantua, will I bear the palms of Edom, and in thy green plain set a temple of marble by the water fair, whose reedy banks are as a delicate net, inwoven there by the spacious curves and slow still wanderings of the noble Miniso, its midmost shrine shall Caesar's image keep. And I, in my triumphal robes of pride, purple of Tyre, will bid a century sweep of four-horse chariots adown the riverside. From the Alphian plain, the Nemean wood, in the great races and with the cestus rude, hasten all Greece to buy. Then will I bind my brows with olive and offer sacrifice, while the slain bullocks and the trains that wind majestic unto the temples, glad mine eyes, or the burying scenes of the mimic stage appear, where the purple curtain rises, as though it were uplifted of the wild Britons thereon wrought, but the gold and ivory doorposts of my fane, 
shall bear the story of the great battle fought, with the Gangaridi ripped in sculpture plain, and in the arms of conquering Quirinus, there and I the Nile's great current runneth tumultuously, surging with battle array of brazen beaks, then the cities of Asia in their devastation shall be set forth, and the victory-crowned peaks of the Nephates and the Parthian nation fighting as they fly with arrows blackwood flung, likewise the trophies twain from enemies wrung, diverse the twofold spoils of the east and west, and there shall be braiding shapes of Parian stone, the sons of Asaracus of the names possessed, which they of the race of Jove do bear alone, and Tros, the founder of Troy, and holy Apollo, the author of it, and envious foes shall follow with fear the pictured shapes of the Furies fell, and the hideous river Coisitus, and the vain toil of Ixion, with the impractical stone, and the writhe serpents of his pain, and the monstrous wheel. But we, the while they gaze, will be following along the happy woodland ways, and glades in violet of the dryad choir. Thy strong behest, Marcinus, upon whose aid they still rely who greatly do aspire. Wherefore, arise and come, and let there be made an end to slothful tarrying. Loudly call the voices along Scytherin's mountain wall, and Apidarus, tamer of steeds, and the hounds of Tegetus, while the murmur of their ascent sounds through the sighing forests and resounds. Hereafter will I gird me with intent, that Caesar's name and the fame of his wars be told, for years to come as many years have rolled, since the prime birthday of Tithonus old. Now the breeder of horses, he with envy smite of palmy honours in the Olympian game, or the raiser of bullocks brave for the ploughing meat, taketh heed first to the mother and her frame. Cows behoveth it such a one to seek, uncomely stern of look and sturdy of neck, with dewlaps that from chin to ankle fall. The flanks are never too long, the very foot is huge and largely fashioned the members all, and the horns are curved back, over ears astute, nor care I if the hide be spotted with white, the face like a bull's, and ready the horns for fight, and the neck to the yoke reluctant. Then the tail must lash the steps, however the statue tower. So come we unto the years wherein avail Lucania's rites and the hymeneal hour. Earlier than the fourth was never known begin. The fruitful time, and the tenth its end hath seen. None others for the getting of progeny are meet, nor yet for the labour of the plough. Wherefore, while yet the lusty creatures be, glad with the vigour of early youth, do thou unbind thy bulls and hasten thee to commend thy herds to Venus, that so thou mayest forfend thy wasting by a promiscuous increase. For this belongeth into our mortal doom, that the best day flieth fastest, cometh disease, labour and age to the clutch of the pitiless tomb. Some then must fail, and some thou well mayst spare. So guard these early from loss, provide repair, and be the young of the flock thine annual care. Nor less the intent the vigilance thou shalt vow, always and from the beginning of their days, unto those of thine equine herd whom thou hast chosen for the continuing of their race. For the foal thou knowest of illustrious birth steps high in the field, and his light foot spurns the earth. In ways untried he is leader evermore. Gallantly breasteth he the turbulent stream, and dares the bridge unmoved of the vain uproar. Slender the head, and haughty the neck of him, his arch, the belly short, and the back hath room, and his fiery bosom, soon as the hour is come, for wedlock swells with a riotous delight, bay red his noblest colour, or haply grey. But turn thee ever away from the cream and the white. Then, when the terrible music of the fray soundeth far off, he cannot be let from going, with ears alert and quivering limbs and blowing his nostrils out, the flames of his gathered wrath, while the tossings of his abundant mane do still sweep the right shoulder falling, and his path rings hollow under the beat of his mighty heel. Oh, such, methinks, was the terrible course attained, of Pollux and Amaclay and Silurus named, and such were they the poets of Greece have sung, the horses of Mars and great Achilles pair, and such was Saturn's self what time he flung, his veiling mane, or the neck of his flying mare, at the coming of angry rear, and did fill with whinnying sharp all Pelion's lofty hill. But even a steed like this must suffer the sloth of growing years, and the heaviness of disease, and take him away from his fellows, nor be he loth to cover the shame of his infirmities. 
for the labour of age is vain, cold its desire, and its fleeting battle rage is a stubble fire, bodiless, bootless. Therefore thy earliest thought is given to the glory of thy stallion's youth. Other and lesser traits of him are sought. Thereafter and the ancestral breed forsooth, and how he hath won the victor's palm and worn, and how the misery of the conquered born. Who hath not seen the stream of chariots fly, forth of the barriers and devour the plain, with headlong emulation? Oh, how high the hopes of the youth! And what a thrill doth drain, with every beat the exultant heart, as lo, they coil the lash, or fling them prone, let go the reins, the axles burn with the speed of their flight, they sink from view then, springing aloft they seem, swept through the void, and outlined upon the light, no stop, no stay, while the rising sand clouds gleam, and the drivers are dashed with flying foam, and feel the breath of those who follow them, such the zeal and the passion of men for praise and victory. Now Erechtheonius first did dare the feat of coupling a car with horses four, while he towered over the wheels in exhalation fleet. But the rein and the ring of the seat of the rider brave, the Pelethronian lap they found and gave. Unto mankind they taught the steed aright, curling a scornful hoof to curvet and spring, as is meet for a battle charger in the fight. But courser and charger are one in that they bring, like toil to the breeder, whether for those or these the spirit of youth and its fine dexterities are sought and the utmost fleetness in the way. I, though the one have erewhile driven before him his flying enemies, and the other may glory in Epirus as the land that bore him, or brave my senior, or his lineage trace even to the first of old King Neptune's race. End of section seven. Section number eight of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book number three, part number two. Thereon the breeder, with assiduous care to round their limbs with fatness, richly feeds the elected stallions, who the honours wear, of lordly rank and the fathering of steeds, serving them corn in plenty and water pure, and flowering grasses, forbidding them endure, how so slight labour, lest the weakly frame of the sun accuse the abstinence of the sire. But the mares he starveth to leanness without shame, and drives them vexed with the stingings of their young desire from running streams and succulent leaves away, or gallops anon till they falter under the ray of the blazing noon, what time the threshing floor groans heavily neath the press of bruised grains, and the idle chaff, as the west wind surges o'er, is carried abroad, for other cares are vain, if the seed land spent with an ecstasy too keen of, of bearing, furrowed unto no end have been, and seizeth no more the germ to hide within. Thus far of the sires, the dams be now thy care, and in the set months when their foals they carry, harness them unto no heavy wains, nor dare suffer them leap in the road, and be thou wary lest they scour the meadows in all too fleet a course, or breast the stream when the ravening waves are hoarse, but feed them rather in solitary places, on shadowy hills or by full-flowing streams, bordered with moss and the greenest of grasses, where they may lie untouched by the ardent beams in the shelter of mighty rocks and hollow caves. Now in the wooded land that Solaris laves, Albernus of the evergreen ilex trees, myriads of winged creatures throng the air, in the language of Rome a city called, but these are gadflies unto the Greeks, and they do scare all herds with their piercing resonance of their wings, and drive them asunder until their bellowings madden the very woods, the stricken sky, and the banks of the Tangier spent with summer suns, and such scourge fierce Juno did apply, in terrible spite to the heifer Io once. But the sighs again, whom the fervours of noon excite, thou shalt part from the pregnant dams, and feed while the light of dawn is new, or the stars be on the night. So come the calves of the flock to birth, and he, the breeder, careth henceforth for these alone, hastening to brand with name and pedigree, that they who are set for the flock's increase be known, and they who shall serve at the altars of the gods, or furrow the field and break its bristling clods, the remnant leave to graze in the verdant mead. 
but unto those who are meet for the energies and the passion of rustic life, give them good heed, admonish them oft, and rule in steadfast wise. For soft the spirit of youth continually and easily be entreated. Wherefore tie loose coils of delicate wire around the free neck of the young creature, till he have wanted grown, and doth no more of such compulsion reek. Then of two circlets cunningly bound in one, thou shalt fashion a yoke, and bid thy bullocks twain keep equal steps thereunder. For yet again, they are harnessed to empty carts whose wheels do make barely an imprint upon the dusty road. Nor yet for long shall the ashen axle quake, and groan with the labour of its ponderous load, or the gilded pole its branded circle to draw. But the younglings docile yet unto no law, thou shalt not suffer to feed on grass alone, or sedge of the fen, or the willow foliage thin, but serve them with gathered fodder out of thine own hand, nor dream of the motherly cow to win, pails brimming white in the fashion of our sires, but lavish all on the young one's dear desires. Or, if thy ruling passion thee incline to ride among the fierce alarums of war, to speed thy flying chariot through the divine bosage of Jove, or skim the banks afar in Pisa of Alpheus, bestow thy care. Burst on thy racer till thou have taught him bear the vision of men at arms for strife arrayed, and to suffer the blast of cornet, and discern the cry of wheels behind, unafraid, and the jingle of reins in the stall, and he shall learn, increasingly as he groweth, to rejoice in the soft flatteries of his master's voice, and the silken smoothing of his mane to love. So try him from the earliest hour when thou dost from the udders of the mare remove, and often in pliant headstalls him allow to show his face, even in his witless years even while weak and shaken of idle fears, then in the fourth summer, after three fulfilled, let him essay his paces in the ring, till he in sonorous even steps be skilled, and knoweth the right his wreathed limbs to fling, alternate, and the will of his lord obey. Then loosen thy rein, and let him have free way, and call to the breeze as flying over the level, he heaveth barely a footprint in the sand, even so do the dry north winds arise and reveal, when they swoop from Hyperion marches, and the clouds disperse, and herald the Scythian cold, and light and swift at first are the billows rolled, over the flooded fields and the bearded grain, then cometh a murmur in the topmost trees, and the breakers press inland from the main, and the gale is abroad o'er lands alike and seas, but he, thy reeking courser, scoureth over, the uttermost reaches of the Ilian field, till the blood sprinkled from his lips doth cover, or yet, mayhap, his neck doth easier yield to the light harness of the Belgian car. Then, when at last his powers obedient are, feed with farrago rich of mingled grains, till unto a mighty bulk his limbs have grown, for ere the docile servitor he remains, he will rise full oft in his wrath, and will disown, touch how so light, of the lash in lordly hand, and the iron tyranny of the bit withstand. But all that thy most diligent care can lend of power unto thy beasts will not exceed what the blind fury of passion may expend. If horses or beeves thy pleasure to breed, lead then thy bulls into pastures lone away, where mountain barriers may their course delay, or the breadth of mighty rivers or them detain. Secure in the yard and feed abundantly, for the strength of their youth consumes in ardour's vain if they do but look upon the heifer young, and she no memory of refreshing groves doth suffer, in them nor the banquet of sweet grass they offer, albeit her soft enticements do compel, to clashing horns and their decision dread, her lovers, howsoever indomitable, behold the beauteous creature who hath fed in the great forest of Scylla, and behold, her amorous pair in furious conflict rolled, they deal swift hurts alternately, and the gore runs black from all their bodies, and they do knit their obstinate horns and push with so fierce roar that the forest and all the ether echo it, and two such enemies never more may bide under the selfsame shelter side by side. But the conquered goeth away into far exile, scorned of his foe, and wistful glances throwing at the stalls where he and his fathers reigned erewhile. And he filleth alien shores with his great lowing, over the sting of his loss and the wounds and shame. So then, that thou invigorate all his frame with labour, and be his nightly couch unstrewn, save with the stones of the field, and let his fair be foliage rude, and the cutting sedge alone, and suffer him scatter the sand and lash the air. 
preluding battle and bore with the angry horn at the boles of trees in the transport of his self-scorn. Then, when his prowess is ripened, maketh he a sudden onset upon the heedless foe. A wave, beginning to whiten in mid-sea, rolleth its bellying volume shoreward, so roars over the rocks, and curling to its fall, foams to its crest, or leaps the sea-cliff tall, and scatters the sand of the deep's dark bed o'er all. Yea, all the generations of living things, of men and ravening beasts and grazing flocks, the watery tribes, and they that of the painted wings plunge in the self-same fires, and suffer the shocks alike of maddening passion, under its goad, the never-so-merciless lioness roams abroad, and mindeth not her whelps, the unshapely bear lavishes carnage along the ways of men, and of the forest, and yet more wanton are then their fierce want, the boar and the tiger then. And ill in the hour when the lust of the brute hath sway, is it wandering in Libyan deserts far away? Nay, hast thou never felt the shuddering strong of thy steed's body, if he do but scent the familiar odour borne the breeze along? Then shall no mastery, how so violent, of stinging lash, nor the rider's bit restrain, nor cliffs, nor caves, nor barrier streams detain, nor the breaker that teareth a mountain from its base. Even the civilian boars do rushing wet, rapacious tusks, and the loosened soil displace with restless feet. And on the tree stems fret, their flanks alternate, and wound and callous make. What then of the stripling when the flames awake, of pitiless love, and fire his very marrow? Late is the night with sudden tempest black, and the surge tumultuous when the strait is narrow. Yet will he breast the sea while over his track, in thunder part for the portals of heaven high, and the billows that lash the crags give grim reply. But he stayeth not for the cry of the wretched pair, who bore him nor for his, his hapless love, who will pass by a cruel death. And why declare what stings the spotted lynxes of Bacchus move, or the savage offspring of dogs and wolves, or the rage of the mighty stag, and the warfare he doth rage? For the fury of all these tribes is naught to theirs, the daughters of them enraged in days gone by, of Venus's self the chariot-harnessed mares, who Glaucus rent for his crimes in Pontnea, now driven of love through floods and mountains o'er, nor Gargarus he, they, nor Asinius roar, but suddenly when the smouldering fire doth blaze, in the insatiate marrow and oftenest, in spring, because the ardour of the spring days rekindles their own, their flight they do arrest, on some precipitous verge, and panting there invite the soft caress of the western air. And verily, however strange the tale, they oft times of no sire impregnate be. But only of Zephyr, many a hollow vale, and stony waste they scour unceasingly, yet make they never for the Orient sun, nor yet for thy dwelling, Orus, but they run toward the homes of Boreas and Chorus and the realm where Auster is born in blackness, and the air in mournfullest pall of chilling rain doth whelm. So falleth drop by drop from the groin of the mare, the very Hippomanes, oft as shepherds tell, mixed with the brewage of herbs, where oft the spell of some hard stepmother maketh a potion fell. End of section number eight. Section number nine of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. The Georgics by Virgil. Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book number three. Part number three. But the unreturning hours do fleet and fleet, while we, enamoured of one only strain, round the circle. Wherefore it seemeth meet we sing of the herds no more, for yet remain the ways of the woolly flocks to celebrate, and the long-haired goats, and the toil is truly great, but nevertheless there is fame to be had therein. Ye sturdy churls, nor dubious hope have I, the meed of the conqueror in song to win, and a lowly theme with praise to glorify. O oh, sweet thy lonelier peak to journey o'er, Parnassus all following the gentle slope explore, A path to Castile never trod before. Bend to mine utterance then, thy majesty, Most reverend Pales, the while I give command, That sheep right tenderly fed and housed be, 
until the leafy spring revisit the land, and straw and trusses of gathered fern also. Thou with no stint shall over the hard earth strew, that haply thy soft creatures do sustain injury that cometh of the icy cold, in many a loathsome malady. And again, feast them on our but foliage within the fold, and carry them clearest water. And do thou mind that all their coats fast closed to the winter wind? Affront the sunshine low in the southern sky, what time the skirts of the receding year are sprinkled of chill Aquarius from on high. Nor hold thou in any wise the wheel less dear, for that their worth is verily one of these, than theirs who yield thee that Milesian fleece, and rubied in Tyrrhenian vats and bartered for so great price. Their progeny, be it known, are more in number, and they are wont to shed their treasure of milk so far more freely down, that pails overflowing with foam but seem to drain the udders and the glad rivers flow again, until the pressure of the fingers flag. Meanwhile the hairy side and the hoary chin are yearly shorn of thy Scythian stag, and the rude webs that these thy tonsures win meet for the shelter of tented legions be, or the sails of the sad wayfarers of the sea, fed in the wilderness of the Lycaean steep, on diet of mountain briars and brambles rude, the way to their homes they still in memory keep, and lead their offspring out of the solitude, albeit they scarce may pass the threshold o'er, for the heaviness of their teats. Wherefore the more, because they ask so little of human care, shalt thou a screen from the snowy gales provide, and cheerfully still their leafy fodders bear, nor cover the hayloft all the winter tide. But soon as ever the summer's gladdening word goes forth in the west wind unto either herd, though chilly the wold beneath the morning star, we will hasten unto the pastures, hoary white, while the dawn is young and the tender grasses are, dew pearled as yet for the roaming flock's delight. But when the unclouded heavens are thirsty grown, and the glowing hour is ten, and the querulous drone of the cicada shrilleth in all the leaves, lead we to water it well or limpid pool, for where it may happen, a wooden trough receives the running rills, then off to the valley's cool, to wild noon where the spreading branches be and olden shadow of Joe's own mighty tree, or neath the impenetrable ilex grove, slumbering hard by, in darkness consecrate, then once again to the trickling streams we move, or idly feed, while the afternoon wears late, until vesper brings the cool, and the glaze once more, are dewy with moonrise, and the songs do soar, of the finch from the thorn, and the halcyon from the shore. Nor yet will I slight in these my rustic strains the wanderings of the shepherds in Africa, and their lone encampments upon the silent plains. By day and by night for moons they roam the land, leading and feeding their flocks, nor ever bide in the homes of men. The desert is so wide. His roof and his home, his weapons and his wares, the Libyan herdsman carrieth still, and leads the Conian dogs and the Cretan quiver bears, even as the intrepid Roman soldier speeds to shoulder his cruel pack and march and show an ordered camp in front of the dreaming foe. Not thus the Scythians by the Cimmeran sea, or the stream of Hister, troubled with sands of gold, or where the measureless bulk of Roatope sweeps to the north, perpetual in fold, the flocks are holden there, nor grass is green. Do deck the field, nor any leaves are seen, but the very heart of the land is hard with frost, and foamless under the heaps of snow, seven fathoms far and wide, it lieth lost. It is winter for evermore, and ever blow the icy winds, and the sun's enfeebled ray clears not the cloudy pallor of heaven away. Neither in the mid-course of his airy team, nor where his car precipitately descending flings over the billows wide one ruddy beam, and the sometime running waters eye are tending to gather in sudden crusts which grow and grow till the rings of an iron chain do stay the flow and the clumsy wain goes heavily where the keel did push before, and the brazen vehicles even are oft-times rent, and the very robes congeal, and stiffen that men in dew, and the wine is riven with axes. Pools are solid unto their deeps, and icicles bristle around their unshorn lips, nor less the while the universal air is murk with snowfall, and the huge oxen stand still, where the frost makes hoary every hair. For the stags have gathered there into a serried band, stupefied under the new descended mass, their uttermost antlers barely overpass, and the charge of the hounds shall fright them never again, 
nor scarlet feathers hurry the trembling things into any net for lo they have striven in vain and an end is come unto all their labourings and pantings under the mountain of the drift when the huntsman falleth on them with weapon swift and smites them belling the while right mournfully and slays and bears them away with gleeful shout oh a safe life and an easeful leadeth he the scythian in his deep dwelling hollowed out of the bowels of the earth by the fireside where he rolls for the burning heart of oak and huge elm bowls there speeds the night with merriment and men drain draughts of the icid juice of the service tree or molten beverage wherein they are fain to find the like of the wine cup's jollity the blast of the north scarce tames these peoples bold and smitten of the rapian east they fold in tawny furs their bodies from the cold now if thou follow the breeding of sheep for wool the prickly shrub and the burr and the colt trops shun nor less the feed that is all too bountiful and white be thy flock and soft fleeced every one nay while thou rams whole body fair as snow put him away if only his tongue do show black where the palate is moist and seek again through all the populous field lest his increase defiled be by a dusky spot or stain the arcadian god with glory of so white fleece thus runs the tale thee luna did enthrall calling into the woods nor didst thou spurn his call but the razor of milk assiduous shall bear to the flocks in fold both milliot and lucerne and salted grasses for nourished upon such fare they for the running streams do greatly yearn and their udders increase and a delicate saline taste is in the milk and many there be who haste to part from their side of the dam the kids new-born and circle their tender necks with an iron ring the milk which is given after the earliest morn goeth at night to the press but the farm hands bring the fruit of the darkling hours with rising day in moulds to the town hard by or haply lay dredged with rare salt for the winter's use away nor let the breeding of noble dogs be found thy least endeavour but in thy pack unite swift spartan whelps to the keen molossian hound and fatten with whey for thou needst have no fright in all thy stables with such custodians of the stealth of the murderous iberians or the midnight raids of wolves or robbers heed then off shalt thou hunt the tremulous wild ass and after the hare and doe thy pack shall speed or drive with baying into the dark morass the scared wild boar or over the mountains high urge the great stag to the net with ringing cry learn too the art to kindle under thy stalls files of the galbanus and sweet cedar wood because the pungent odour thereof appalls the offensive serpent and when thy sheds have stood long years unmoved the viper vile to touch and timorous hides from the daylight under such and lieth in wait to foul with venomous dew his victims among the cattle haste thee then o shepherd and and him with stocks and stones pursue and beat him down nor suffer him lift again the sibilant menace of its tumoured head so shall the reptile bury him deep for dread his midmost knots incontinently undone and stilled his quivering tail and dragging slow the last of his writhings such an one informeth all the calabrian glades with woe and ever his bulging bosom doth erect and scaly back and belly long bedecked with monstrous markings he while the channels yet of the streams are full with springtide and the land with the floods that come in the wake of oster wed dwells in the pools or hovers against the strand and filleth his livid moor in cruel greed with chattering frogs and fishes then indeed when the fens turn dry and the fires of summer make the fields to gape he rolleth his burning eyes and leaps to the land the sometime water snake frenzied with thirst and the fear of the ardent skies and he ravageth all the region heaven forfend that i my limbs in the grassy grove extend and suffer me not beneath the open sky to court sweet slumber at that perilous tide when he creepeth anear in the new-found bravery of youth for his outshorn sheath is flung aside and leaving his brooded eggs his curling young he flashes aloft the steel of his three-forked tongue end of section nine Section number 10 of the Georgics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. The Georgics by Virgil. 
Translated by Harriet Waters Preston. Book number three, part number four. Hear also what the signs and sources be of thy dumb creatures' maladies, for thy sheep are smit sometimes with a loathsome leprosy. When the chill of the winter's rain hath gone too deep, or that of the hoary frost, or the body shorn, is fouled with sweat, or the briar hath rudely torn, then shall thy shepherds lead unto water sweet the stricken flock, and see they are all besprent, and the long-fleeced ram shall bodily plunge in it, till the current carry him down, and an unguent of oil and sulphur and silver scales prepare, and pitch and wax and the sea-leak mingle there, bitumen black and the pungent hellebore, or better still the fortune that shall await thy kindly care, if thou put thy knife to the saw, seeing the ill that is hidden grows more great, when thou but sittest and prayest the gods for aid, nor ever a healing hand to the wound have laid, so when the body is wholly racked with pain, and a fierce insatiate fever burneth deep, behoves to temper the fire and smite the vein beneath the foot till the blood therefrom do leap, such is the wont of the wild Gelonian men, so do the Thracians of Basaltia, when they hire them to Rhodope for pasturage, or the Dacian desert, and with milk of mares, commingled with horses' blood their thirst to swage. But the dam, who still remote from her fellows fares, who daintily pulls up the grass tips, or doth make for restful shade, or all in languor take her feed, as she lays outstretched in the open plain, who strayeth at night into the lonely haunts away, and away followeth last of the moving train, her, without any tarrying, thou shalt slay, or else the infection of her ill severe will taint the flock, or ever thou knowest fear. For the squall at sea, the herald of tempest dire, strikes not more suddenly than the pest that fall, oft times on the flock, nor singly do they expire. But the summer camp is desolated all. The flock, that is, and the hope of the coming days, perish in one, the first and last of the race. As well he knoweth who the ascent hath made, of the alpine summits, or haply taken his way to the hill forts of the Nori land, or strayed along the Timavus in Iapidia, where the shepherd's realm lies desert many a year, and the glades are solitary far and near. For there, on the burning autumn long gone by, the very heavens with pestilence were stricken, the peaceful flocks all given over to die. Yes, even the savage beasts in their lairs did sicken, and the ways of death were manifold. For indeed the fountains of water were poisoned in the feed, and first a pitiless fever did contract the veins and cramp the sufferer's limbs. Thereon followed the flow of a deathful cataract, where the bones dissolved piecemeal and were gone. And oft times in the midst of a sacred rite, among the ministers of the altar, dight in woolly cap and fillet like unto snow, fell the ill-fated victim and expired, or ever the lagging priest could deal his blow nor were the entrails upon the altar fired, nor might the soothsayer answer men who prayed, the knife came clean from the throat to the thin gore made, barely a stain on the surface of the sand. Then perished amid the meadow blossoms gay, the bullocks in never counted numbers, and at cribs overflowing their sweet lives yielded they, and unto the kindly canine race there came, fierce madness and breathless coughing racked the frame, and the swollen jaws of the unwieldy sow the conquering courser e'en forgot his pride and passion, forgot the grasses where they grew, and turned him sick from the limpid farm to side, restlessly pouring the earth. Despondent hung his ears, the while there were fitful sweatings wrung, out of his members, and the same were cold, as ice in the sufferers ordained to die, whose hard hot skin gave not unto mortal hold. And these so ominous warnings verily were given long days before the fatal end. But when the advancing ill began to tend, even to worse the eyes did kindle as flame, deep drawn and mingled with groanings of distress, and spasm in all the entrails. The breath came, dark gore from the nostrils flowed, and the tongue did press the throbbing throat most cruelly. One sole way, there seemed the pangs of the dying to allay, and wine was given them in inserted horns, which yet did hasten the end and feed the fire. For now on himself, the death-struck creature turns. May the gods avert from the pious woe so dire, reserve it unto our foes, and in despair. 
doth his own failing members mangle and tear and oft the steaming bullock striving to thole the ponderous plough fell prostrate suddenly with bloody vomit and cry of mortal dole then did the ploughman hasten him to untie the yoke and the bereaved one divide right sorrowfully from his fated brother's side and the share stood fixed and the task was left undone the shadiest grove the sweetest meads no more might waken the longing of the passing one nor rivers brighter than amber where they pour over the pebbles toward the fair champagne for the long flanks lay unnerved and the eyes in vain struggled with stupor while the enfeebled neck swayed heavily earthward and what boots him now to have lovingly toiled for men who little reek the weight of the clods he hath lifted with his plough what boots the innocent life that ne'er hath known the flow of the massic cap nor the boards that groan with manifold courses but the herb of the field and the leaf of the tree supplied their banquetings and the wine of the feast was that the rivers yield when they run fast and clear and the bubbling springs and the healing slumbers ne'er were stolen of these meek revellers by hard anxieties men say that never in all those regions far were the oxen sought in vain ere that dread time for the sacred service of juno but her car and equally drawn of buffaloes did climb the way to the stately temples and men did lay their helpless hands to the mattock and essay themselves to turn the sod and bury the crane or patiently bow their necks to the yoke and o'er the steep of the mountains draw the creaking wain the wolf went prowling about the fold no more a nightly terror unto the flock for lo he had cowered to a sharper fear and the timorous doe and the fleetfoot stag did unregarding roam with ravening dogs about the men's dwellings and then there came a time when the sea did fling as foam o'er the rejected bodies of shipwrecked men her tribes to the shore and in the self-same days the seals escaped to the rivers in their amaze and in her torturous hold the viper died having sought sanctuary there in vain and the venomous hydra bristling terrified in scaly armour the fields of air were sane even unto the birds no longer then who sped precipitately from their dwellings overhead nor change of pasture might any more avail the flock for misery came out of every one of the precious healing arts their heads did fail amathonian melipus and the son of philyra chiron and pale tisephaphon break forth of the stygian shades ferociously tossing her cruel head in the light of day driving before her pestilence and affright and the arid banks of the river ran along and the pasture slopes with bellowings infinite and sorrowful bleatings while the goddess of woe multiplied slaughter and the heaps did grow in the very stalls of putrefying dead whose skins were good no more for the garments of men nor was the filth of their flesh abolished by floods of water nor could the fire make clean hardly even be shorn the victim's fleece so was it eaten away by dire disease and the webs if woven crumbled under the touch or did men seek infatuate to assume those hateful vestments out of the limbs of such there break a sudden torrent of sweat a fume of loathsomeness then burning pustules came no long delayed the accursed fire to claim its piteous prey in the infected frame End of Book 3 End of Section 10section 11 of the georgics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil Schempf. the georgics by virgil translated by harriet waters preston book 4 part 1 the honey of heaven's own giving next i sing and lend me thine aid Messenus, also here for the slender theme shall waken thy wondering when thou seest the ways of a mimic race appear its works and its wars and its high-souled chivalry and not as the labour slight shall the glory be if the stern gods will and apollo favour me a sheltered place for the hive shall first be sought where never is reft the homeward winging bee by frolic winds of the pollen he hath brought and suffer not sheep nor petulant kid make free with the flowers on eye 
nor the vagrant heifer pass to scatter the dew and bruise the springing grass and the gaily harnessed lizard and bee-eater put from those opulent dwellings far apart yea all the birds but the swallow chiefly her with the mark of a bloody hand upon her heart for they ravage the region far and wide and seize and bear in their beaks away the wandering bees a delicate morsel for their boisterous brood but choose thee a site beside a bubbling spring or a pool with a vesture of verdant moss endued or a rivulet through the grasses hurrying where a palm or an oleaster tall may cool with grateful shadow the rustic vestibule that so in the happy early spring when first the new-made monarchs their winged hosts array and gamesome and glad for their deliverance burst the young from the hive they may cool them from their play on grassy banks hard by or a sheltering tree invite to its leafy hospitality then into the water be it quick or still fling stones or carry a willow over it for a bridge whereon the bees may rest at will and spread their wings to dry in the sunny heat what time the wind may have caught them straying wide and sprinkled with spray or plunged them in the tide green grow the cassia in all the region round the blossom of time makes sweet the summer slopes and heavily breathing savoury abound and violets quaff the trickling water drops but whether the hives that are wrought for bees of thine be hollow of bark or woven of osier fine make i their openings narrow for that oft thou honey is curdled by the wintry chill and again the ardour of summer maketh soft and the cold and the heat alike do work it ill wherefore not vainly do the diligent bees besmear with layers of wax the interstices of their small dwellings and their openings fill with flowers and the pollen of flowers and always keep gathered and stored for the uses of their skill a glue more dense than the gum the pine trees weep on phrygian ida but if men say aright the bees themselves oft burrowing out of sight make snug their secret domiciles underground or deep in the heart of crumbling rocks dispose or where a cavernous tree trunk shuts them round with hollow bark do thou then deftly close the chinks in their cells with delicate paste of clay and gather a few light leaves thereon to lay but suffer never a you those roofs anigh nor roasts at the fire the ruddy crab nor set thy hive where thou hast a fathomless fen hard by reeking with odours heavy and foul nor yet where the rocks ring hollow when thy blow hath stirred and the startled shape recoils of the spoken word for the rest when soul in golden armour dight hath driven the winter into banishment and earth and air do bask in the summer light the bees range over the countryside intent on forest nooks where the purple flowerets gleam or pause on the wing to sip the running stream then build they a bower for their young and would i knew the secret of sweetness them doth gladden so for they the new wrought wax of their cells imbue with wonder of honey over rich to flow thereon when out of their prisons break the swarm and sail for the stars through the sunny air and warm thou shalt follow the dun cloud carried in the wind's wake to the water sweet or the shades alluring still and with scattered herbs a savour of sweetness make the lowly balm or the bruised mellus fill then raise with beaten cymbals a martial din till thou the bees to their perfumed seats do win and clinging by twos they hide their cells within but go they to war for the wrath of rival kings carrieth commotion to this busy race at once and afar thou knowest their quiverings of heart for strife and the rage of the populace for a brazen murmur of mars a grating call as the broken blast of a trumpet summons all the laggers unto the fray excitedly 
on flashing wings they hurry them to the beat and making ready for battle as they fly they on their beaks their stinging javelins wet and throng the king and the royal cell about and loudly unto the foe their challenge shout till the battlefield is clear and wholly fair the heaven of spring then sally they from their gates and loud is the concourse in the deeps of air what time the confused host agglomerates into a mighty sphere and gathered so is rolled precipitately upon the foe then the sky thickens as it were with hail or the rain of acorns out of a shaken oak but they of the royal pinions rise and sail round the ranged bands whose vision doth provoke heroic valour within the tiny breast till they of the high resolve become possessed right steadfast in the enemy's front to stand till the one or the other army breaks in rout under the weight of the victor's heavy hand yet a handful of dust flung upward past a doubt this mighty conflict suddenly may compose and the fury of all those spirits bellicose but soon as the rival chiefs return from strife do thou on the seeming worser straightway fall and slay lest mischief come to his fruitless life while the better is bidden reign in his void hall for twain they are and eminent to behold the one and flecked all over with rugged gold and burning in ruddy mail but the other lags unkempt inglorious and along the way the sprawling bulk of his body slowly drags and the forms of the people vary so they say even as the faces of their sovereigns do for some are coarse and squalid unto the view as wayworn and bedraggled travellers be who spew from fevered lips the dust o the road but the others do dazzle and flash incessantly with equal dashes of golden fire bestrewed and this the worthier race whence thou shalt get sweet honey in its season not only sweet but clear and strong for the taming of bacchus meat now when the winged creatures far dispread in the free heaven do sport them without aim spurning their hives and their homes abandoned forbid these volatile ones their wanton game whereto and verily tis an easy thing thou needest but shear the pinions of the king for never the while the monarch's feet delay dare any subject creature insolent along the loftier ether pursue his way nor sever the standard from the royal tent let neighbouring gardens then the bees invite odorous and all the saffron blossoms bright and old priapus him of the hellespont defend with sickle of willow from the theft of man and bird and diligent souls are wont to plant by the hive the thyme or the pine tree reft from its home in the hills ay such as these do wear their hands with labour the wilding plants to bear and set in the earth and water with kindly care and verily were it not that i draw near my destined port nigh ready to furl my sail and finish my task right gladly would i here sing of all blossoming gardens where avail man's loving cares and of the roseate bowers of pestum twice in a summer fair with flowers and the joy of the endive where the rivulets pass and the joy of their verdant banks in parsley blow and how the cucumber twines amid the grass and wonderfully its fruit increaseth so and the flexile thorn twigs would i celebrate and sing of the sweet narcissus flowering late and the myrtle that loves the sea and the ivy dun i mind how under tarentum's turrets high where the brown waves of the river goliasus run freshen the yellow fields of harvest i an exile of coricus a man of eld tilling a few spent acres once beheld nor apt for the plough were these nor the bearing of corn to nourish the flock nor kindly unto the vine but how had he filled the home of briars forlorn with goodly garden herbs and bidden to shine white lilies and vervain round his ordered beds and esculent poppies bear aloft their heads 
the treasure of kings in his content he found and lingering late in the field he came at eve to a humble board with unbought dainties crowned his the first rose of the summer to receive the first of autumn's apples and he anon when fetters of ice were laid the streams upon and the frost of surly winter had riven the rocks and the streams were chained with ice was fain to shear the blooming hyacinth of her lovely locks while he chid for its tarrying the vernal year and the lazy zephyrs long upon the way wherefore his new-born swarms did see the day earlier in the spring and in their numbers more than all beside he from his combs expressed the foaming honey in more abundant store and limes and the most luxuriant pines possessed and never a fruit did set in flowering time upon his trees but ripened in autumn's prime his even the art the elms well grown to bear afar and set them anew in ordered rows likewise the fruited sloe and the hardy pear and the plane tree offering shade where water flows and wanderers drink but these fair themes must i narrowed in envious limits hasten by leaving their tale to my posterity end of section eleven section twelve of the georgics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phil schempf the georgics by virgil translated by harriet waters preston book four part two but favor me yet while i the story tell of marvellous powers the bees do hold of jove because in his natal hour they served him well swift to the symbols brazen din to move of the curetes and unwearying in the caverns of dicta fed the heavenly king for they of all the little creatures of earth alone do gather in cities and uprear as one the sons to whom they have given birth and order their ways lifelong by laws austere while the joys of the hearth and certain habitations are theirs and a fatherland among the nations and theirs the forethought even in summer-tide to toil for the time of tempest and of want and that they have gleaned securely away to hide while some do under a steadfast covenant watch over the store and some are busy afield and some are gathering the lucid gums distilled from tree stems or the tears of the daffodil wherewith to make the beginnings of the comb within the walls of the hive and thence with skill to hang the persistent wax and other some the full-grown hope of the race lead forth to light and others yet with honey as nectar bright the crowded cells distend while unto a few it falleth to stand like sentries at the gates by turns the cloudy tokens of rain to view in heaven or on the returning toilers wait and ease their fardels else in battle array forming they from their dwellings chase away the indolent folk the drones and everywhere is the glow of toil and the honey's thymy scent no busier the monster band of cyclops there in the mountains on their thunderbolts intent handling the molten masses promptly to ply the bellows fashioned of bull's hide mightily or to quench the hiss of the metal in the wave while the weight of their anvils maketh etna groan and the powerful arms a giant rhythm have as the bulk of the iron is lifted and is thrown from one to the other upon the forceps strong not otherwise dare i liken in my song small things with great are the cecropian bees by the inborn hunger of possession driven to labour in kind wherefore their fortresses and towns are i in the ward of the ancients given and the curious carving of each roof-tree small but the young and strong returning at even fall weary of limb their treasure of time unlaid for that they have supped on cassia or arbuta boughs or off the golden willow a banquet made 
or where the crocus's fiery blossom shows or dark blue hyacinth or the lime tree sheen and the rest of all is one as their toil hath been till the morn returns again and the gates are wide and the bees do never upon their going stay but range until admonished of eventide back from their feasting in all the fields come they and ready for rest and shelter yet once more buzz in the boundaries murmur about the door till unto their bedchambers they softly creep and silence followeth all the night unbroken while each tired body getteth his own sweet sleep and never in sooth if coming rains give token venture they far abroad nor scale the height of heaven when the east is risen in his might but under the sheltering ramparts of their town go safe to water and brief the flights they make or as light skiffs the turbulent waves would drown take ballast of sand they tiny pebbles take and lift in the air and stay thereon resist the fluctuant motions of the hollow mist this also is matter of praise and wonderment the custom of bees in bringing forth their young for never do they cohabit nor are spent their frames with fury of passion nor yet wrung with anguish of travail but off dainty leaves and delicate grass blades evermore receives her little ones on her lips the mother bee she too whenever the throne doth vacant fall findeth a king with the following of romans we and shapeth anew each waxen court and hall wherefore though off the bees allured wide by love of the beauteous blossoms and by pride in the gathering of honey break on cruel stones their fragile wings and under their burdens die though narrow the life-span of these generous ones seven summers barely yet immortally the race lives on and steadfast evermore the star of their line they sires of sires tell o'er ay and they render homage unto their king such as not egypt nor the famed lydian land nor median hydaspes nor the parthians bring only one soul hath all the obedient band he sitting secure but once their monarch lost rent is the covenant of the loyal host and rent the curious wicker cells wherein was laid their honey treasure for he the lord of all their labour and all their love hath been forever throng and press the vociferous horde round the king's going and on their shoulders bear him oft for him imperil their bodies fair and wounds for him and glorious death do dare and some who deepliest on these marvels dwell discover an emanation in the bees of the world soul divine a breath as well of the pure ether unto the thought of these one same divinity dwelleth everywhere in the reaches of earth and sea and the deeps of air out of whose infinite sources all that live men and the tribes of the field and of the wood their vapour of being do at birth receive then tender it back again and in the flood remerge for death herein is found no place they to the host of the stars do wing their ways and the summits of heaven behold their endless days now he who is fain to enter the tiny house and steal the treasure of sweetness hid therein carrieth water within his mouth and blows first over the hive the bees therefrom to win or drives them forth with waving of pungent smoke the opulent produce of this busy folk is twice in the year expressed and harvested once when the pleiad teagite first does smile over the land and under her light foot tread the river oceanus and again erewhile when the self-same star is flying from heaven fain to hide from the stormy fish in the winter main sadly but what immeasurable wrath what lacerate wounds for them who seek her store what venom infused the insulted creature hath she drives her barb in the veins with a thrust so sore the living weapon doth in the wound remain but if thou dreadest the winter's cruel strain and taking thought for the morrow of bees dost feel pity on their sore hearts and fortunes low what lets thee from enkindling for their weal time branches under the hive dissevering so the empty cells 
for the lizard unbeknown hides there and the beetle blind his couch hath strewn or the doingless drone sits down at another's board or the hornet fierce doth war with arms unfair or the direful moth or the spider most abhorred still of minerva curtains the doorways there with swaying webs the lowlier fallen before yon stricken race they labour to rise the more and flower-built granaries crowd with richer store the like moreover of human maladies anguish of sickness languor in all the frame the law of their being bringeth unto the bees note then the unvarying symptoms of the same the colour is changed in them who suffer thus and wild the countenance and cadaverous till the bodies of such as lose the light of day forth of their homes are by their fellows born and laid with sorrowful funeral rites away else cling they unto the portals all forlorn with knitted feet or in their cells lie still famished and spent and shrunken with mortal chill dull now the murmur that falleth upon the ear and deep incessant whispering like the tone of wintry auster within a forest sear or the vexed ocean when his billows moan refluent or even as ravening fires do roar shut in close furnaces wherefore let me implore thou light the galbanus for its fragrant smoke hard by or proffer honey in tubes of reed so putting a heart in thy outwearied folk and toiling them forth to the remembered feed and flavour the lure wherewith thou then dost ply with bruised galls and savour of rose leaves dry or the rich liquor that remaineth of wine long boiled or the juices of scythius dead ripe fruit or attic thyme or the centuries fragrance fine but free in the fields asking no long pursuit there groweth a star-like flower the labourers call a mellus hardy and many branched and tall and the golden head of it is ringed around with countless rays of the violet's dusky hue bitter to taste yet in fair garlands bound for holy altars in valleys grazed anew or oft by the windings of mella shepherds call this flower whose root with sweet wine thou shalt maul and set by the doors of the hive in baskets full but the offspring of bees oft faileth suddenly nor means hath any the master to restore their line wherefore commemorate will i that which the lord of arcadia learned of yore and how from the weltering gore of bullock slain the honeyed race hath wakened to life again so then the marvellous fable to relate from its first origin in the long ago a land there is where the dwellers fortunate in macedonian canopus behold the slow submerging of all the land by river nile and visit their fields in pictured craft the while hard by the persians dwell who carry the quiver but egypt getteth her green from the black loam borne wide abroad by her seven disparted river swept onward still from the dusky ethiop's home and the lineage of bees is indestructible in all that land by the power of this one spell for a sight confined is chosen seeing it falls in with this very purpose and thereupon a structure set and bounded by four straight walls with a narrow tiled roof above them thrown and windows four affronting the winds of heaven and a slantwise entrance unto the daylight given thereafter a youthful steer is found and tan with horns already curling his forehead o'er and the breath of his mouth and of his nostrils twain smothered and stayed although he struggled sore and all with violent beatings bruised and blent the viscera within the whole integument then do men leave the carcass imprisoned so first crowding the ribs with time boughs odorous and new called cassia when first the west winds blow and wake into life the waters do they thus ere the rosy blossoms in all the meadows gleam or the prattling swallow hang his nest from the beam and the days go by and the liquor seethes lukewarm in the macerate bones till wonderful to behold myriads of living things footless do swarm there out 
then straightway resonant wings unfold and throng and throng the ether like summer rain or shafts the string of the archer's bow that strain when the agile parthians people a battle plain end of section twelve section thirteen of the georgics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phil Schempf. the georgics by virgil translated by harriet waters preston book four part three but what divinity showed us this device tell us o oh muses how did our race receive its earliest hint of so strange artifice when aristeus the shepherd essayed to leave the borders of peneus and tempe's vale he had wholly lost his bees thus runs the tale and sorry with sickness and with hunger faint he stayed his foot the uttermost source beside of the holy stream and uttered wild complaint my mother my mother cyrene who dost thou bide deep under these gurgling waters tell me why thou bearest me to so cruel destiny is not my race illustrious i divine thou saidest apollo of thimbra was my sire o oh, whither is fled that sometimes love of thine why didst thou bid me unto the skies aspire for now behold my mother although thou be i am losing the crown of my mortality my hard-won fame for the curious care i spent alike on the harvest and the herd the vain fruition of infinite experiment if then thou hold mine honour in such disdain uproot my nurseries fair with thine own hand set fire to my stalls like a foe my harvest land lay waste and the promise of my crop consume or wield thee a ruthless axe my vines among then under the waters in her far-off room the mother discerning the cry of her son's wrong she sat with her nymphs about her and they did pull for spinning fleeces of Milesian wool saturate with hue of ocean's hyaline there were drymo and xantho ligeia philodosi with bright hair clustering about the neck's white sheen Nicaea and Spio, Thalia, Simidosi, and the golden tress Lycorius was also set beside Sedipe, the one virgin yet, the other happy in her first motherhood. And Veroe was there, and Cleo, sisters these born of the ocean, and gold girt, and a dude alike with garments fashioned of tinctured fleece, and Ephyra and Opus, and the Asian maid Diopia and last among them stayed swift arethusa with arrows laid in rest while clymene in their circle sang the tale of the futile anger of vulcan and how the zest of mars in theft and strategy did prevail then the loves of the mighty gods innumerable beginning with chaos would in order tell but captivate by the melody while they all slow from their spindles the soft flax unwound again the ears of the mother caught that call of anguish and from their glassy seats around all startled sprang her fellow nymphs before the yellow-haired arethusa first up bore her head above the waters and gazed amain and far off sounded her voice o oh, sister mine cyrene thou wast verily not in vain heart stricken by yon sad cry that son of thine thy dearest aristeus dissolved in woe stands where the waters of father peneus flow and thy hard heart most bitterly doth upbraid then was the mother smitten anew with fear go bring him bring him hither to me she said who better than he hath right to enter here o'er the sill of the gods and the flood she bade divide that her boy might find free footing under the tide so came he while before him still withdrew the tall waves curving crag-like and gave him place and following along those vaulted spaces through under the billows he saw with deep amaze the watery world the seat of his mother's rule and the ringing groves and many a cave-locked pool 
and the great sway of the waves benumbed his brain for all the rivers of the wide world were there moving in their channels subterranean phasis and lycus and the deep fountains where anipus and father tiber their rise take and anio still and hyponus that doth make perpetual murmur upon his rocky bed and mycian caicus and the bull-visaged po having the two horns gilded upon his head than which no river of all earth doth flow through richer fields or more impetuously discharge his tribute into the purple sea so now the wanderer being fully come unto serene's bower did entering in pass under the spar-hung ceilings of her home and she the story of his wild weeping win the while the sisterhood in procession fair for the laving of his hands pure water bare and napless towels but others yet intent the viands heap and plenish the drained cup and all the spices of araby redolent sweetly the smoke of the altar fires goes up till the voice of the mother soundeth lift we thus maonian cups and unto oceanus libation pour then made she orison to the lord of life in the sea and the sister maids whereof an hundred haunt the rivers alone an hundred minister in the woodland shades trice then on the fire the liquid nectar shed trice leaped the blaze till the roof tree shone overhead and staying her soul on the omen thus she said down in the abysses of the carpathian sea a prophet of neptune steel blue proteus bides with a finny train and biped horses he in a chariot over the plain of ocean glides and visiteth even now Pallini and the ports of his macedonian fatherland and we of the nymphs do hold him in deep awe so even doth hoary nereus for he knoweth all things which are and have been and them which draw hither out of the future he foreshoweth neptune ordains it there where he doth keep sea calves and herds of monsters under the deep this proteus child must thou in fetters bind till he deliver the cause of all the woe thou sufferest and promised issue to thy mind he giveth no oracles otherwise than so compelled nor softeneth he for any prayers or power him therefore and chain him unawares and circumvent and shatter his idle craft now i myself when the fires of noon are hot and the herbs of the field are all faint for their dew draught and the herd for the shade will show the secret spot wherein the ancient many a time doth steal weary of the waters and his form conceal for while he lieth asleep thou mayest draw near unstayed but when thou hast grappled him and bound his manifold transformations will appear all shapes of savagery mock thee and astound and now of a bristling boar he takes form and now of a tiger fell or a mailed worm and now of a lioness with tawny mane anon with a sudden hissing as of fire he slips thy chains and is lost in the wave again wherefore do thou son with implacable ire the more he changeth tighten thy bounds the more till he taketh again the shape that erst he wore when thou sawest the slumber steal his eyelids o'er so saying she an ambrosial balm did shed and saturate all the body of her son till even the ringlets of his comely head breathed perfume and a subtle power did run his members through now there is a mountainside vast excavate in a grotto where the tide forced mightily inward by the wind is cleft and seeketh sinuous channels far withdrawn herein full many a mariner storm bereft hath found safe harborage in the years agone and proteus cherisheth here a lurking place behind a mighty rock through devious ways hither the nymph conducts her child and leaves in hiding and from the outer sunshine turned while a nebulous veil herself hard by receives lo now in the firmament fleet sirius burned the planet of thirsty ind and the sun on high had half devoured his course and the herbs were dry 
and under the fierce combustion of those rays the very slime of the river beds grew hot and the waters vanished out of their hollow ways then proteus even as his wont was ever sought a refuge out of the billows in the caves the humid folk of the universal waves leaped round his going scattering bitter dew and seals lay stretched in slumber about the strand the while from a rocky throne he did review and tell the number of all his ocean band as a herdsman upon the hills at even fall leadeth his flock from pasture back to stall while the bleating of tender lambs the ear doth wet of the listening wolf but ready for mastery seized aristeus that thing of eld ere yet his weary limbs unto sleep composed he falling upon him with a mighty cry clinching with manacles there where he did lie and the monster not oblivious in the least of his old arts miraculous feats essayed of infinite transformation horrible beast and fire and a flowing stream by turns was made till baffled of flight and beaten in every guise he came to himself and spake in mortal wise under whose orders thou most insolent youth invadest thou my dominions what's thy will but he thou knowest thou knowest full well in sooth o proteus he who would cheat thee wasteth skill have done then also with all those wiles of thine for verily the lead i follow is divine because of my fallen fortunes come i here desiring an oracle he spake no more with a mighty spasm then the soothsayer did roll his burning orbs the invader o'er green glaring and while he ground his teeth with hate there issued out of his lips the word of fate End of section 13section fourteen of the georgics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil schempf the georgics by virgil translated by harriet waters preston book four part four thou art smit by the wrath of a god and dost atone great crimes it is orpheus in his misery thee scourgeth now for a wrong unwittingly done unto him so may thy fates deliver thee he is wild with sorrowing after his vanished bride who hasted unto her death by the river side from thy pursuing nor e'er discerned so in the tall grass at her feet the hydra fell but her dryad mates uplifted a cry of woe whose echoes high as the mountain peaks did swell and the summits of rhodope bewailed her sore and the hills of pangeum and rhesus martial shore and the river hebrus and the dwellers in thrace and athenian orethia but he was fain by the ocean strand in a solitary place to soothe with hollow lyre his heart in pain and woe for thee my beloved he sang alway for thee in the dawning thee in the dying day thereafter did his footsteps even invade the jaws of tenerus and the doors of dis through the dark of the awesome grove his way he made till he came to the main's home and saw i wis the king in his terror and essayed to move with prayers of a man the hearts that know not love then from the lowest deeps of erebus rose the shadowy folk thrilled by his minstrelsy tenuous the far-off images of those who here lost life so myriad birds do fly driven of the rainy gale the deepening night to leafy cover down from a mountain height the spirits of mothers and of men were there and many a shape of high-souled hero dead and young things laid on the bale for the despair of them who bore them striplings and maids unwed prisoned mid the coarse reeds and murky mire and sluggish oozings of the cocytus dire and by the ninefold circle of sticks compelled 
but him the secret corners of tartarus and houses of death with deep amaze beheld and they of the braided tresses tortuous with livid serpents even the eumenides yea the dog cerberus as stonied as these held his three mouths agape and the wind impelling the wheel of ixion and the wheel did rest he had well nigh scaped the snares of yon dread dwelling he had turned to go and given unto his quest eurydice by the will of proserpine was following his feet to the upper air divine when a sudden craze on that bold lover came oh surely if hades aught at all doth know of pardon there shall be pardon for the same but reckless conquered of his own heart ah woe on the very confines of the light stayed he and looked back upon his eurydice undone his work now and annulled the bonds of the stern tyrant while an all-piercing shriek in three times heard around the avernian ponds oh what is this madness orpheus gan she speak why hast thou wrought this ruin for hapless me ay and for thine own self listen said she the cruel fates are calling me back again a drowsiness creepeth o'er my swimming eyes i must say farewell meseems that i am ta'en and carried along the black immensities outstretching these incapable palms of mine feeling after thee but ah no longer thine turning even so she vanished out of sight as a vapour breaks and is lost in the viewless air no longer for all his frantic striving might he clasp that shadow and his full heart declare and never again will he be let to cross up orcus's janitor over the guardian fossey what can he do now whither himself betake will all his wailing over his twice lost love soften the manes or compassion wake in the gods of the underworld nay she did move cold o'er the waves e'en then in the stygian boat seven full months under the skyward cliffs remote by the desert water of strymon men do say he wept his woe in the gelid caverns drear and wrought it into so masterful a lay that the oaks and the softening tigers came to hear so mid the poplar foliage philomel the sorrowful tale of her lost young doth tell whom featherless yet the brutal husbandman hath marked and torn from the parent nest but she the self-same strophe of mourning doth again and yet again deliver distressfully keeping her perch on the bough the live-long night filling all the space with querying's infinite no other love no nuptials any more might sway the soul of orpheus but he did move alone the hyperborean glaciers o'er or yet by the snow-bound banks of taneas move or wander the meadows widowed ne'er of frost ripian still bewailing the vanished ghost and the mocking gifts of pluto at the end the dames of the sicones in their fierce despite at his so deep devotion him did rend young limb from limb in the midst of a sacred rite at the nightly orgies of bacchus and were fain to strew his parted members over the plain then when aegrian hebrews rolling by did carry in his midstream that marble head dissevered from the neck incessantly the stiffening tongue and the isolate voice yet said eurydice ah poor eurydice so with escaping soul entreated he and the shores replied far off eurydice proteus thus far then with a mighty bound retreated into the deep and wheresoe'er he goes the forming waters are whirled around under the eddy but aristeus's fear was calmed of cyrene who fled not so but straightway unto her son did counsel show now mayest thou ease thy spirit of anxious care my child for here was the source of every ill that wretched fate of the bees did they prepare the nymphs who danced with her on the wooded hill do thou then seeking for peace by prayer and gift unto the kind wood nymphs thine offerings lift for pardon is one of them when vows are paid and quieted soon their ire yet listen son 
while the manner of this thy sacrifice is made plain and the ritual of thine orison four bulls of excellent comeliness who now do peacefully graze on the green lycaeus's brow select thou first and after as many more of heifers yet by the yoke inviolate then set thou up for thy victims altars four at the shrines of the goddesses high and consecrate and let the sacred blood from the throat and bear the bodies to a lone grove and leave them there then when her ninth arising upon the skies aurora showeth do thou to orpheus proffer the poppies of lethe for a sacrifice and also a sheep with ebon fleeces offer and once more having appeased with heifer slain eurydice revisit the grove again he came at his mother's word without delay to the shrines and the ordered altars did evoke four bulls of excellent comeliness did slay four heifers all inviolate by the yoke then when aurora her ninth arising made the appointed sacrifice to orpheus paid and came to the grove and a wordless wonder spied for the molten viscera were all alive with bees they buzzed in the belly strove in the riven side then rose and floated away toward the topmost trees and their following long made all the ether dim till they hung like clustered fruit from the swaying limb thus did i sing of the care of field and flock and all the trees of the forest while afar euphrates deep was feeling the thunder shock of bolts the heroic caesar launched in war and he victorious winning his way to heaven by righteous laws unto the willing peoples given but i virgilius all that while possessed and nourished of my sweet parthenope did put forth blossoms of an inglorious rest trifling with pastoral strains for i am he who daring and young the song of thee essayed o titurus under the beech tree's breath of shade end of book four end of section fourteen end of the georgics by virgil translated by harriet waters preston